Good day, everyone. Uh, we are on a developer's call of the FreeBSD GL subsystem. Today is June the 21st, June? June the 21st of 2023. This is for future archaeologists in case they find this video somewhere on a hard drive, maybe. Uh, we current attendees are uh, myself, Antronik. There is Jan, as always. Shivank has joined us after we tried to kill ourselves last week. And uh, we also have Michael, there we go. And uh, we'll go over a lot of questions from the community. And we also have a lot of questions to Shivang for the amazing work that he has done. Uh, I wanna say three, four years ago. So uh, let's, let's, get, uh, let's get one by one. And uh, this, this I think is the shortest one. Michael, you made a new wiki page. I mean, not a new one, you just cleaned up the gels page, right? After our call uh last time so let me just re refresh yeah this. there were a few too many references to freebsd6 and the free vps project and other things especially okay. features that have been incorporated years ago okay so i as i put it in social media decrufted it and then i brought in things like the vnet page which were very similar to the netgraph page okay brought in what i could made a list of a separate doc that i've linked in the minutes of where some possibly valuable content is. And then I did my best to untangle certain aspects of it and give it some sanity. It would okay. be amazing if someone could jump in and mark which of those jail management tools is still active. They can okay. live there for now, but some I think are a decade old and untouched. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the work. I'm, I'm also still uh, moving documents from my blog to the wiki on a, a, you know, a noob's guide to FreeBSD because there, there's a lot of parts of the setup that is not in here yet. So this is how I celebrated the 30th anniversary of FreeBSD because FreeBSD jail got me here 20 years ago. So that's correct. Yes. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, everyone. Uh, that's one. Thank you very much, Michael. And from last week's Kill Me Now, we, we, we saw this review, which is, let me see if it's this one, if I'm right. Yes. Uh, so Shavank, you wrote this, right? Can you can you tell us more about this? How, why did you do this? And actually, even before we start, do you want to do an introduction? This is your first time on our call. Uh, what uh, you do, who yeah. you are, take your time. The floor is all yours. Welcome, Jamie. Uh, greetings, Jamie. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm a software engineer at Qualcomm. Uh, I work on Android audio frameworks and uh, uh, like I, uh, I did my like uh, bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering uh, at IIT Kanpur, uh, and I uh, uh, connected with FreeBSD in 2019 with this uh, code only. Uh, it was a GSOC project. To in uh, uh, that's all. Yeah. Th that sounds good. Uh, so you you did join us over the uh, GSOC project, which is a very nice uh, productive. Uh, can you tell us more about this uh, um, the, the the diff that you did, like what it does, how it works, most importantly, and uh, where did you step? Because the last comment that we get in here is uh, <clears throat> is uh, let's see. So uh, we have a DCH saying this appears to be accepted but not merged. Can we have it in thirteen? That was two years ago. And then we finally get uh, Michael no. saying this appears to be accepted uh, with, if, we get, if we get it in 14, which is hopefully very soon. So uh, yeah, we would like to hear more about the details of how all of this works internally. And uh, uh, and, and if you have tested For anyone it lately, who doesn't well. know, uh, Michael is hiding behind the call for testing account. Uh, thanks for considering this, uh, like for merging. So. Uh, like uh, this uh, project is focused on uh, creating a Mac policy module. So Mac policy module is based on uh, trusted BSD uh, Mac pol uh, Mac framework. And uh, so it is like, uh, I think uh, there was a person deb drub, D-E-B, D-R-U-P. Uh, so mm -hmm. that person requested uh, for this module. And uh, uh, it, it is like uh, in inside, uh, jail now we can set the now the jail can set their own ip addresses using vnet so uh like we want to limit uh jails functionality of setting their own ip address we want them to set 
uh, IP address in particular range only, or like we want to discard some IP address, uh, like uh, limits jails uh, uh, from setting some IP address. So uh, like we install some hooks in the uh, IN dot C in the network interface, and uh, and those hooks will call some hooks in Mac framework those uh, and then we finally reach uh, reach to our module mac ipacl.c which will uh, like first uh, like there we can uh, input our rules like uh, as you're going through this uh, ma uh, man page we can input our rules using this kind of like a string and uh, uh, that mac module uh, will uh, parse these rules and then uh, it will check each IP address that if it is allowed in that range. And then if it is allowed, then it will return success. Otherwise, it will return failure. So if I understand your design correctly, it is, the validation happens via a callback when configuring addresses using IF config and an and IOCTO. Uh, yeah, here, like in the code here, the mm -hmm. validation here, uh, ah, yeah, so here is. is the hook, yeah. So we uh, use this mac macro uh, SIO CA uh, FI address. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is for IP IPv6. So uh, we pass the credentials of the uh, the function who is calling, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the I, uh, network addresses to this mac inet check, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, it it is calling our uh, mac ipacl.c where we are checking the address. So first we check if this address if this cred credential is called by a jail uh, if it is called by a jail then we go through our string of uh, rules and then we uh, we check uh, those ip address like if it is allowed or not whatever okay. the jail uh, is setting and a noob question how do you configure which jail is allowed which ip that goes over cctl there's a mip in the cctl tree under uh, his module. Uh, yes, you can CTL. see an example in the main page. Security Mac IP ACL, and then IPv4, IPv6, and rules. Yeah, here, like here in the comments, yeah. Uh, Assign IPv4 one, yeah, here. The syntax with the add a, a separator is a bit unusual, but. Add the rate, yeah, uh, like. Yeah, we but you can't of... use a colon with IPv6 yeah. like the port ACL module. Yeah, that's why we thought of at uh, this embers yeah. uh, at the rate. Nice, nice. Uh, and remind me, uh, wasn't there like a specific utility for managing mandatory access control as well? Uh, there is sometimes one for each module. Okay, but there's not a generic one. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. This is very nice. So, okay. So, so the, uh, the INET subsystem talks with the hooks with the Mac subsystem and then the Mac subsystem goes over the rules and checks if the jail is allowed to have that IP to set that IP or not. And what, and if someone tries um, to run a, a binary that can craft IPs, I assume it's going to get blocked or not. That was just what I was about to ask because mm -hmm. what happens if inside a VNet enabled jail a raw mm -hmm. socket is used exactly uh to uh, and i think this with raw sockets with right options you can listen to the any address and spoof an answer so this wouldn't protect against this and the other problem i foresee is that um it doesn't cover anything but that's a configuration error if you put the address there before the policy is loaded Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Because it's applied at time of change. And the next question I would have is, what happens with IPv6 uh, route advertisement processed in the kernel? So the, if there's never an IF config call to edit, but you just enable router advertisement processing on the interface with uh, accept RT app will. Are there any credentials to match against this? in this case. And does it go through the same code path or is there another path? Not that the credentials pointer is null or uh, it bypasses the point of check. Uh, 
So I, I don't see anything here about that, by the way, Jan. I assume that raw, uh, right, 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 Shivang, the raw packets would just go as is, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just uh, about setting the IP address. It's also not the about address. the data. Mm -hmm. uh... The data path. Okay, understood, understood. Yeah. yeah. But the very elegant part about this is that there's zero runtime cost because yeah. the validation happens at time of uh, check. You do, do not slow down the uh, forwarding path at all because if yeah you... that's true that's true right like if 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 someone doesn't have root access on the machine on the jail uh well actually even if someone has root access that's actually a good question young can we have a vnet jail that is not allowed to have a raw packet jamie you um might... good question i have never tried that what happens in this case Hmm, no, that, that even with VNet, just like on the host, you have to have the right permissions to open. So you have to be super user inside the jail. If you disable super user mm -hmm. inside the jail, you uh, will not have anyone able to open a raw socket. Exactly. But this breaks all of the uh, RC.D scripts going through SU because SU will try to set up the user and will get refused when it tries to set the user ID and so on, because sorry, user zero, you're not a super user, you're not allowed to uh, set a, a user ID. So set EUID will fail inside SU and with, this in turn is used by most of the RC.D mm -hmm. scripts. So you can only use a non super user uh, jail with single binaries basically, mm -hmm. or as long as you don't use any of the RC.D scripts, which is so almost the same thing. You're saying that there are RCD scripts inside that can run inside a jail that are required to try to set an IP address? No, the thing is that one way to prevent you from creating a raw socket mm -hmm. is to make sure that nobody inside the jail can be a super user. Okay. Uh, and there's a jail parameter to disable super user so that not even root inside the jail is a super user for the jail. Oh, I did not know that. Uh, allow S user or something. Uh, slash jail. And then you search for S user. There we go. Allow S user. Okay, thank you. And if this is uh, set to zero, uh, nobody inside the jail is uh, a super user, but the problem is that it breaks SU, even uh, for the case where SU tries to stay the same user. I see. Because it see. still tries to set it, trusting that it is uh, it runs as root, and will get told, sorry, you're root, you cannot say that you would like to become root. So because set EUID, is a super user operation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it allows you to, if you weren't super user, it would allow you to escalate your privileges and mm -hmm. uh, to go to a user ID you don't already have or the zero user ID. And because of that, the security check prevents it. I see. So I see. it breaks all of the normal rc.supra based script I see. because it will almost always go through SU. Which reminds me, we here also have to add something like allow that D-trace for, you know, allowing D-trace um, inside the jail. As far as I know, it's not there on purpose because uh, D-trace cannot be trusted to I mean, run inside a jail. I mean, the, the Illumos folks have solved that, you know, in zones. Yes, uh, they zone have in their kernel. Yeah. FreeBSD hasn't. Okay. <laughs> in theory, okay. it can be done, but of far course. from trivial. Okay, so so uh, 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 Shivang, so you wrote this, and uh, did you test this lately? Is it working now? If you build it, or is it uh, not not no? At all? Actually, it's not. Uh, so I wrote this Kua file, Kua uh, ATF test scripts to test. Yeah, I was gonna say th thank you for writing. You know, uh, uh, a test file. So, <laughs> so is there a FreeBSD release? This should be tested against as patch just thirteen point zero. Uh, and then forward ported? Maybe, yeah. This may be easier than trying to take it and without ever doing an integration test with 13.0 as it was released. 
Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. And he, here we can see that. Oh. Wow, talk about UDP attack. Oh, God. <laughs> Your whole voice came all together. Okay, no, it's fine. Uh, so so you, and the checking part is done by let's see uh, that's a this is a very big, big test that's nice so you have let's see what do we have da, 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 da. and then you make vnet pairs and then you assign jails and then you start doing jexec uh, if config okay so if configuring inside of a jail okay and yeah, okay. So it's just setting, you know, things with if config. That's nice. And then you have rules that you assign the rules using the CCTL. Okay, got it. This is actually very straightforward as a test and, and as well as the usage, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So I wanted to ask in here, um, do you think this can also apply to like P2P? P -P, what, what we call a point to point, basically, you know, if an I if if we want to use something like WireGuard, do you think this would be doable? Uh, it should already work as far as I look at the code because uh, it's the same concept, uh, right? Being in the to. yeah. Um, on WireGuard, you have an additional complication, mm -hmm. which in this case even works for you. And that is that the WireGuard configuration uh, tells you which public key so is allowed which IP addresses. So which inside, key? so okay. if you have a, if this is a bit off topic, but in WireGuard you have a interface conf a configuration section with your private key, um, uh, MTU and similar things. So things which apply to the whole interface and then one section for each peer. And for each peer, you list the uh, IPv6 and IPv6 address, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses this peer is allowed to use. And this is validated and it's part of the forwarding logic. So if a packet is from the kernel network stack's point of view, a WireGuard interface is a point-to-point -point interface. But mm. inside this point-to-point -point interface, WireGuard will look up the allowed IP uh, for all peers, find the one peer which is allowed this address because mm -hmm. these have to be unique or undefined. If there's no peer for it, it gets dropped. If there is a peer for it and there's an established session, it gets used. If there's no established session, but the endpoint is configured, it will try to establish a session. Okay, and if you get a packet in, it also is validated against the yeah. allowed IPs. So this part is already solved for WireGuard, but at nice. the other end. Uh, okay. So you may be able to misconfigure your node, Yeah. but the remote peers will validate against their allowed IPs and we'll drop your uh, spoof packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So here are some questions. So Shivank, you did run this, it didn't work. Do you think it would be easy, to, based on your experience, of course, do you think it would be easy to port this again to on, onto 15, 14? Because we know uh, that 14 got delayed. Maybe we can actually, you know, shove it in somehow. Yeah, I think, yeah, we can uh, do it by then. So uh, there is actually one small problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Like uh, there is uh, like uh, I'm checking this network credentials. Uh, I'll comment here. So this printf jailed, uh, like I'm checking this call uh, in the, uh, I, I sent a comment on the uh, yep. Zoom. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so I'm checking this jailed cred. So this uh, actually is uh, not uh, giving, like this is giving zero. So. Uh, even if I'm calling uh, this, uh, uh, if config from inside the jail, then also it is, uh, this call is giving uh, zero. So like, I'm confused why this is happening. Like ideally you should give one if I'm calling if config from the jail. So wait, let's say jail, the question, the question is... is jailed and it's trying to print the jailed cred. Okay, and the credential is from cred prison. It doesn't okay, and it's printing. Okay, yeah, yeah, Jan, so, you were saying uh, something. Yeah, the question is, 
is this the cred are these the credentials you expect them to be could it be that you're matching against some other credential a uh, um, ucred pointer which isn't the one you wanted to match against uh so i'm uh, like i'm putting this check in the uh, in.c and in6.c mm -hmm. there uh, there earlier it was giving this jail credentials when i wrote the code but now i uh, see that this is giving this, these are not the jail credentials like it's something uh, i'm messing up in the new system as far as i know we never changed the jail abi so it 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 should work as is uh let's let, let's actually try looking into that so let me change this back here uh is this in your current diff in the testing part or in the checking oh yeah it's in the checking uh, part no, Sorry, no. Yeah. so i i was putting logs to debug this oh code. i see uh, this okay. was not working okay. so uh, but if you check um, the mac ip so this call is there jail uh, cred is there in the mac ip acl.c uh, and and the question what does this jailed thing do uh it's it will macro. give uh yeah it's a macro it will give one if this uh, credential is called from the jail oh, okay uh, i see i see well but do we have a macro like that somewhere oh I, I so never... this macro is ex uh, expanding to this function uh in the second statement i'm putting cred cr prison and uh, okay. not equals to prison zero okay so let's do that yep there you go so you're getting jailed zero although it is a jail yeah correct um, okay can you use function boundary uh, checks with dtrace to capture the arguments to the function and dump it with dtrace to find out what's happening without having to re unload the kernel module change it recompile it load it again oh okay because anyway dynamic load, uh, loadable module so uh, it's uh, easy to uh, load yeah. it yes. in runtime. So, so that's a good point. So, you, uh, the macro is returning you zero, and then the cred is returning you zero, which okay. And then these the, are compares, not uh, the actual yeah. pointers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but the last one, the GID, also says zero. Yeah, that's that one should not one. say zero. Yeah, that's even way stranger. And this, no, yeah. it isn't. If you're checking against an unjailed credential. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like you're on the host. Yes, the uh, credential no, I, he's looking at is on the host. That's the strange part. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I took a shell inside the jail using that J exec and jail name and shell. And mm -hmm. then also I called if config. Uh, then like I, uh, I was simultaneously checking the D message. And I was seeing this log. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is this is a printf inside your uh, module. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you keep getting this. Okay. So the relevant part is in uh, the net inet in dot c and the net inet six in six dot c. Yeah, correct. Net inet uh, inet. Yeah. That's a, that's wait a second. That's a good point. What one sec? So, um, does a vnet know it's a vnet? I mean, because you know the, the host is also a vnet. So it's a system call. So there is a user thread. Yes. Performing the system call. Yes. This thread has a has credentials, which is the cred through the process it yes. is in because FreeBSD normally has process credentials. These yes. credentials then. Uh, no, if they're in a jail or which user they run at. It's yes. how you, so we would have to find out how uh, it finds out the current kernel code, how it checks if you're the super user before you're mm. allowed to modify the interfaces. Which credentials does it validate this against or which function does it invoke to find out? It may be that there's some kind of thread local variable or something to access or some other function to get basically find out the, something about the thread which invoked me basically. Mm -hmm. Because we're here in the synchronous part of the kernel. Mm -hmm. The upper half of the kernel which runs on behalf of a system call. 
So there's a call, there should be a kernel stack looking something like uh, syscall indirection through the right system call table, um, ioctl handler, the right ioctl. Yeah, so this uh, if config is calling a ioctl handler, handler, which is calling that SIO C A F I like C that macro. And in that macro, uh, there is a this uh, I uh, I that macro is called uh, checked in in dot C. Yeah, this macro S I O. There we go. This is the one. So this is for so this is the ioctl handler. Yes. Okay. This is in in. So this is IPv4. Okay. Um, if def mac, here you go. Okay. Jamie? Yeah. Well, we have you here and we're dreaming about features. How hard would it be to get this into the jail.conf syntax so that a jail could, a jail configuration could also include this policy so that you don't have to feed it in via into host, the CCTL. To the CCTL. And one question I asked earlier is how do you reference uh, jail just by jail ID or by name? Uh, just by jail ID. Okay, so you don't have any problems with re uh, resolving names if jails get created and destroyed. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you just avoided a whole uh, nest of potential problems yeah hey I, but that, that's a good question D does the policy get destroyed or not destroyed does the policy get removed if the jail is destroyed it's not tied to the jail yeah so it's just a string the policy is just a string we set in a, a cctl variable so um, okay so if you say like if it's not tied to the jail then um how does it make sense to make a jail parameter of it well, the uh, creation makes it's logically sense. tied to the jail, just not in code. Um, it applies to a jail ID right now, and it would be nice to have basically the jail command be able to replace the jail ID after the jail has been created. Created, yeah, of course. Uh, we just take all the other fields. But what about removing? This, insert the jail ID and load the po and update the policy. But what about removing that? That's going to be a nightmare. Um, yeah, I'd rather have it actually tied to the jail structure itself and not just a jail ID indexed thing in the kernel. Yeah, but that's harder to do and requires more locking. Yes. Oh, right now yes, it, it looks like every time it runs, it has to repass the string, right? Which isn't too bad because it's only done on administrative commands like so this is completely in the control uh, plane uh, by the way Shivank, you're muted i noticed that you were talking yeah sorry uh, actually that uh, we can set that string one time and then uh, it's independent of jail id so whatever jail id we set uh, like if we destroy or uh, create jail it doesn't matter for that policy so that's actually a good point. So now, now, if we look from an ecosystem perspective, we can have the jail command parse a configuration of a jail config that says my IP should be this. And after the jail is created, the jail command would set the MIB, everyone is happy. But then if you remove the jail with the jail utility, it would also remove the policy. Again, everyone is happy. This will only become problematic if a jail... Uh, if, if a user removes a jail without the jail configuration and we don't really because right Go now on. it uses the jail id and it takes a special kind of user to reuse jail all right by accident. <laughs> that that is correct yes that is if correct. you Thank have you. the jail command create a new name jail it will yeah. pick a monotonically increasing jail id yep yep until it overflows uh, if yep. never run into this in production but in theory no. it drops now we should try that one day, but I mean, uh, Uncle Dave created a one million jail in yeah, one second, and just, he never had a problem. Um, one million is far off. We're talking about two point three billion. billion or so. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, so no, I, I, I think sign forty-two bit overflows. The point we worry about. 
Yeah. No, I, I think on that end, we're fine. And I mean, the integration would, wouldn't be that hard. That's also yay nice. And the last bit to think in here is about the raw sockets, but let's not go into deep for that because that's a whole other story. Um, 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 that is a whole other story. And and so 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 you you are having a problem with this, which is when you're running the... Uh, the if config or whatever that you were running to check for the credential inside of the jail, it's telling you that it is not jailed while it is in reality jailed and you don't know why. I don't yeah. know how to check for this except using dtrace to see what happened. Uh, the interesting part would be to dump the kernel stack at the this function exactly. call in dtrace yes. and then uh, grow the dtrace script up to inspect the function arguments. Yes. Yes, Shivam, do you have experience change. with do you have experience with the trace? Uh, like not really, but I'll uh, gain the experience. Like okay. I'll try and then yeah. Sounds good. So what what we'll do is at at this part of the document. Actually, let me do it this way because we've had good success in that. Is let's see. So I'll just insert a. Um, we call that what the hell is that called? I hate Google Docs. Uh, a horizontal line. There we go. Uh, working uh, section. And then we'll need another horizontal line to close that because, you know, it's HTML stuff. So, yeah, what we'll work in here, what was so uh, let's try to pull in your patch. And on dtrace, there is a uh, a command called someone remind me what's it called? Is it crash? No, inspect. Damn it. Uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to force a panic? Yeah, the force panic. I think it's called panic. Uh, why would you do that? So you can inspect the kernel. But you can dump the kernel call stack without panicking, right? Thank you. Yes, you can do that with a stack. You want you want to see the stack, yeah, and then you want the to uh, dig in the call stack for the arguments, and start, hope there are some struct help. Pass otherwise, you have to look it up, cast it out, and uh, invoke D traces print uh, for it. Stack. Um, there we go. Uh, we have that in case you need a panic. I think it's called panic. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll just, you know. But that's really a bad way to do that. Yes, because you're not corrupting state. Okay. You're not corrupt. Okay. The panic is what you do if you can't proceed without damaging something. Okay. So in we this have a... case, um, you just let the. Uh, so operation you want to uh, deny proceed, which is an error, but it's just what would happen without this kernel module. This kernel state isn't corrupted. You can still debug everything properly. Mm. So I wouldn't panic it because it's, it's slows down your development cycle so much to crash the system and then you drop into the kernel debugger. So okay, uh, what's nice about this is that you kill the system at the point you want to, which is why it's so powerful to use dtrace to panic the system because you can basically inject asserts. So here, here's another, another, another bit in my mind. Um, if we look into dtrace and we'll list everything that is inside the uh, uh, Mac framework, that's Mac underscore framework. Uh, did I do that wrong? One, two, three. We do. Oh, we do have calls inside the Mac framework. We have two hundred and forty-three probes on uh, inside the Mac framework yes, that does everything from mount, vnode. What do we need? Net. That would be nice if we have a proper uh, dtrace provider for this. Uh, yeah, that would be the easiest bit. Like it's the literally... question is, does it cover what you need? Does it cover what you need? That's and another thing to watch out for is the dtrace um, function uh, tracing can't uh, see into inline calls. So if you have something like uh, the jailed macro, if this was, let's say this was a static inline function, mm -hmm. which is just a one line or something like the um, comparison in the line below, if you had a function with such a comparison in, the compiler probably wouldn't um, ever emit the code if it was a static inline function defined in the header. 
and you couldn't use the D-trace part. There is some work being done on this mm -hmm. to have the debug symbols basically track all the inline instances of a function and where to find its arguments. Because with inlining, the arguments may not be on the stack because you're not bound by the ABI. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gets a bit trickier. Uh, as part of this, we recently gained support at least on AMD64 and maybe even on ARM64 for basically function plus offset um, single stepping on instructions which is then the level you would build this on top of. Because now you can basically break on individual instructions instead of just function boundaries. Okay. But I haven't, I've seen the commit messages. I haven't had a use case for it yet. So I don't know how far along it is. And the, the, the function that you're using here is Mac init check, right? Do we have- um, This is the new function. Yes. Uh, wait, what? It's added. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah yes it is. You. Yes, it is. So I'm wondering if, because some parts of FreeBSD automatically exposed itself, exposes itself inside the kernel in the FBT, right? I, I think inside the FBT. All module. kernel functions are visible via FBT. Perfect. So it, it means that debugging this would be all much easier. And by the way, even for the modules? Like the, 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 the so. dynamic kernel module? Okay. I don't know if only those loaded before the D-trace module. That would may be, be the case, no. but... I, I'm not sure. Actually, I think we can even check that. Uh, for example... I haven't at this. The, yeah, I know, right? KLD, not KLD load, KLD stat. For example, if ePair is a module, it's not inside the kernel. So if we do D trace dash L uh, grep if ePair, uh, yeah, no, you can see it. You can see it. Even the dynamic modules are seen. That's good. Yeah, inside the FBT. That's good. Yeah. So if, if you do attach your kernel module, uh, as long as it does attach, fine then you should be able to uh, detrace every function that you have in here. So the debuggability yeah. process will become a lot easier. And um, one question I have is if this policy is updated, should it be rerun against all configured addresses and the ones denied by the current policy uh, removed? Sorry, go again. So if there's a non-empty policy loaded. Mm -hmm. If it is a non-empty. If the policy is changed and the policy is not empty. So at least one rule. Should the module go over all uh, local addresses and validate them against the, um, and validate them against the policy? So that if you have a VNet enabled jail started and for example, and it does this IPv6 uh, auto link local stuff and so on, and you want to deny link local addresses because you're a masochist or stuff like this, um, should it clean up? Um. So currently we are not doing that stuff. Like we, we are just, uh, uh... Like if we are adding and it is denied, then the uh, jail will lose that IP address. It's like that. Mm -hmm. It can't configure uh, an IP address in violation of a, a policy once the policy enforcement is enabled for the address family. But what about the addresses already there at the point the policy is defined? Oh, correct. So, this can, so, 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 what you mean is, is, is telling you that it doesn't apply retroactively? That's fine. It's just that I haven't seen this gotcha mentioned. So, what you mean if if I have a jail, I configure it uh, its IP address, and then I apply the, then I enable the Mac. What was the or name? Or you just change the policy? 
Or I just change the po okay, I see your point. And it, yeah. the address would no longer be allowed under the new policy. But because it was allowed in the previous yes. policy, it will still be there, right? Okay, got your yes. point. Yeah. Got your point. Okay, that that's a very valid point as well. But you know what? I mean, we have this done. Let's make sure that we get this into there first. And yes. then we can start integrating on two ends. One of them is on the jail end. So we can have maybe we can have this inside of the jail conf. Jamie, can we have this inside of jail conf? <laughs> I'd rather see it attached to the jail itself and not the JID if it's going to be in the jail conf. Something like a, uh, you know, if it's a syscontrol thing, then you can put it in something like the host name is where you've got, yeah, you cool. set that syscontrol in the jail as part of the parameter. We have a number of parameters that basically go into syscontrol strings. Yeah. And, and if it could be one of those, it would fit very easily into the jail conf and cool. also work out better as yeah. far as index not looking up the jail by id but just being you know right there with the jail pointer it's uh, a, a function to get the per jail mip uh, tree node so if i have a jail id can i get the sysctl tree node representing this jail's parameters Uh, not, I know. What question? 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 Um, yeah. th that does mean breaking the ABI, right? Because we will have to add stuff mm. inside the jail struct. Not oh, really. That's, that's not breaking the ABI. That's extending it. Okay. Thank you. The <laughs> ABI uh, is not a fixed struct, but it's a nested tree structure, and you can just add new child nodes. Okay. Understood. Basically, it's think of it like adding a new field to a JSON object. I think, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the old ones were still exist and work yeah. fine, etc. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, okay, uh, Shivank, thank you. This was very educational. Is there anything we can help you with to get this done and hopefully land it by 14? Uh, is there a new timeline for 14 yet exactly? Or is it just like delayed? Um, I have, last I have heard is within the week, there will be a timeline. The same thing I heard last week. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know what? Let's not rush it. Let's make sure, because this is a security thing. It's better to make sure it does what it's supposed to do rather than have any bugs. But even if it what does is is this, I mean, it's it's perfect, you know? It, it will be useful for a lot of people. I, I can tell you that. Like, I can, I can easily see infrastructures like uh, uh, that, you know, the jail hosting companies, a lot of hosting um, companies who use jails, they would love to have this, you know? And something... Which could be useful. So um, if we get this under the jail tree, the lifetime gets a bit easier because it gets recursively deleted with the jail node. So basically yeah. as soon as the jail is destroyed, it's child node under the jail's uh, MIP node in the SysCTL tree gets uh -huh. destroyed. And this is done recursively, and uh, sure hope the kernel does this locking correct because it's done everywhere. The dynamic societies are created and destroyed. Okay. And yeah, this. Okay. So, um, anything else, anyone, or should we go forward into more things that would make me kill myself? So, I think we we've don't gotten past the two that you brought up. I would love to know with Jamie present about these two other PRs but and reports and this reviews. would be a perfect example for something you would want to create from an executable sub configuration to be included. An executable sub configuration. Okay. Uh, what I talked about la uh, during last week or the week before that it would be useful for the jail includes if the file to be included is um, executable, then to execute it and expect it to write a, a, a jail.conf snippet to standard output. So basically to use popen to execute it and read its standard output. You mean something like this? Yeah, exactly. Bin sh. Sabine jail. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that, that, <laughs> no, no, not that. Uh, I mean, a shell or Python script yeah. to be started, uh, which will then query some kind of 
IPAM solution or send or database or whatever for VIP addresses of this tenant. Does that make sense? Yeah. You would ask uh, Consul or ETCD or whatever you're using as your source of truth to tell you this jails allowed IP addresses. This is in very old um, oh, yeah. one by ad. This is uh, anyone aware of who added it? Uh, Michael, you added this, right? Uh, added what? This uh, patch of okay. jail numbers keep incrementing? Yeah, That's so what you want. it was marked in the wiki as uh, 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 reverted. And yeah. we need to verify that. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. So, I don't know. Uh, the jail numbers keep on incrementing and that, so every time you create a new jail without an explicit jail id which is a feature jamie regrets even adding uh, the jail number the jail id is incremented and i think he wants to use the uh, driver unit number allocator which is already a compact data structure used by normal drivers to find the next lowest available unused index mm -hmm. so if you create a new uh, wireguard interface dynamically you, it will not take the highest number plus one but it will take the lowest not allocated number okay you know that's certainly not a change we ever made no uh, but i think this is what he wanted if you yeah. pick the, the next three so that the numbers stay low but the problem is that uh, this makes the case, which normally gets ignored in all jail managers, namely uh, reused jail IDs, this makes this an expected everyday occurrence instead of a Connor case, which will only happen after more than 2 billion with a B I absolutely jail agree. ID creations. I absolutely agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. Because, I mean, all of the user land applications, they rely on, okay, every boot, I know every JID is unique. But... Um, regarding jail ID reuse and ABI bracket and the deprecation of 32-bit uh, platforms, would it make sense to bump the size of a jail ID to a 64-bit number? Would or wouldn't? Would it make sense? What would be the, the downside of doubling the size of a jail ID uh, from 32 to 64 bits? Because Actually, it's not affect... only 32 bits. For for you can specify jail IDs that are past that nine 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 limit, but I don't think the automatic ones ever do. So if you specify a jail without a fixed ID, that does limit your number of jails. That's off the top of my head, so I'm not sure. But that's oh, what so right. wait, there's a limit to six decimal points before the yes, I think so. I, I'm not oh. sure that you can create more than a million jails as currently constituted. And if I ever do this. What will happen? Will I get reuse or will the next jail creation fail? Yeah, the, the next jail creation would fail. Oh, this is a case, uh, a CI pipeline where long run times and fast tests and lots of jails could potentially reach. So a million is uh, easy, given the right workload. So wait a second, we're talking about that our limit of jails is 999.999. And it doesn't overflow. It just doesn't create it, without an explicit it, right. ID. I'm I'm going to make sure I got to look at the code because it, you sound more surprised by this than I expect. Yes, yes. I mean, I've run a lot of tests on this, and uh, my my limit was always one million. Because I mean, come so, on, it's, it's that's, that's I it's, had, it's, it's a I big number. I have had uh, production systems with five digit jail numbers in the upper five digits. Yeah, but like the, the, 60 the or 70,000 jails created over the runtime of a system between reboots. The difference between five digits and six digits is like a magnitude. And that yes. is a big difference. That's why we never understand why billionaires exist in the first place, right? No, so no. The, it, the it, thing it, is <laughs> that this would mean that I was within 30%. Basically, I had used 70% of a potential lifetime of this system. Yeah. I, I have to ask. How old was that system's uptime? 
months. Three or four months. Oh my God. Okay. It was well, a Prodeer system where the cron job had to run interval. And it just now, kept... you're talking about this many simultaneous jails or this many jails ever created? Because it does create you know... ever created. Oh no, that's not a problem. I'm talking there's a limit on a million simultaneous jails. Oh, okay, Ooh. that's a different story. So you if know... it wraps around and looks at the numbers again, it doesn't just okay. hit the top. That it makes just more won't sense. assign a number past the top. Okay, okay, okay. So so if you reach nine 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 nine, yep, then goes back it... to one. Okay, yeah, okay. Because because I that's know what that I Uncle... would have expected from a yeah, look at the yeah. code years ago. Okay, because I know that Uncle Dave, like he did the one million with Lua's a, a API and he never had a problem about that. So I assume it reverted or whatever it happened with his system, right? But you're saying if 999999 GLs were actively running at the same time, okay. then, yeah, the then, one then, then it would say no more jails. That's fascinating. I wonder if there is a person who reached like five digit at the same time, you know? I mean, okay, maybe no. a supercomputer. Um, I, so considering jails right now, and I'd like to change this sometime, but it has locking issues, have multiple um, text strings with fixed 1K buffers, then millions of jails, you're, you're talking about gigabytes of jail storage in the kernel. That's not really hard to reach on systems with hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes of RAM. RAM. That's, yeah. that's true, Remember but there that are still we, systems we where you would notice added it. We recently added 57-bit physical address space support. So you can have more than 2 to the power of 48 uh, bytes address space thing in the page table because FreeBSD added the next level of paging. Uh, uh, J Jamie, one sec. So each jail takes one kilobyte of address? It, it takes a number of kilobytes, yeah. Number of kilobytes. It's got okay. the uh, jail path name. It's got the host name. I think it's got at least one other thing like that. Um, huh. It's not that. OS name, Jamie, stuff like that. Yeah. Those are allocated with malloc in the kernel, right? Uh, yeah. What's the reason you're not just using the sbuff API to uh, concat them into a single buffer, even uh, because if I remember correctly, sbuff, the, the ABI, API is available in the kernel, uh, can handle all this automatically growing strings. And Because they're part of struct prison runtime. and just kind of have been since time immemorial. Yeah, sure. This API isn't as old as jails, I think. Okay. So uh, we're not looking into this, right? Because it makes no sense to even think about this reusing of the numbers. Uh, looking into reducing the memory cost per jail would be worth looking into, but the, yep. it's probably a bit late now. Uh, yeah, that's that's a to do sometime. Be that's uh, not a to do in fourteen. But what you really want is what I would foresee you want is. All the fields which will never grow over the lifetime of a jail to be allocated from a single object and then just indexed with pointers so that you uh, have minimal fragmentation. Yeah. And anything which gets ever grown to get its own slab allocator, if it's unless it's very differently sized, so a Yuma zone or something. Of course, some some of them are things that can change. You know, they're like the host name and the other uh, syscontrol yeah. type things. You know, that, that could be changed. Of course, some are like the path that is fixed. It might only be the path that is fixed offhand. The, uh, yeah, the path and the name. Oh, yeah, the j path jail name. Path jail name? Jail name can actually be changed. Jail name can be changed. Yeah, with a dash. decision, but it can be. Yeah, with a dash M, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it can be, yeah, yeah, it can be modified. Okay, okay. So the jail ID, but would still the same. The jail ID yeah. is an integer. It's, it, and it never changes. Life. Okay, okay. That That's perfect to know. That's actually, okay. Well, it doesn't change over the lifetime of the jail. Yeah. But I ask about if the IPACAL module accepts jail names because the mapping from name to jail ID, if you have a configuration file which accepts jail names, you have to look up the jail ID corresponding to the name. And if the jail gets destroyed and a new one with this old name gets created, you have to retranslate this name to a jail ID. 
So yes. uh, th that is a good point. I mean, if if the current patch that 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 uh, Shivon has created uh, is doing the check once, it would make sense to also allow the names. The most elegant way is the one Jamie recommended, and that's to move the path in the SysCTL tree where the uh, policy lives. So that instead of having a single global policy, um, which references the jails by ID, move the policies, split it up into multiple policies and have one per jail, potentially per in jail. the jail object in the SysCTL tree. So that, that does actually bring some more interesting questions. So here, here are some questions that I have from a setup perspective. And uh, Shivang, you might know the answers to this, which is if I enable the, I, I really have to read the name because I still don't know what the name of the patch is. Let's see. Uh, uh, IP ACL. Okay, got it. IP ACL. So if IP ACL is enabled, but no policy is written, right? It's empty. And I have a jail. Right, there are no policies about this jail, and I do if config. I can do whatever I want, or I can do nothing at all. Uh, so you will not be able to do anything because uh, okay. uh, uh, because I uh, like uh, it will disallow all the IP addresses. Got it. IP ACL is enabled. Default and, deny. Uh, so the yeah, default is denied. That's but there are yeah. enable and disable per address family. So you have an IPv4 yeah. and an IPv6 enable or disable. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you, so if you, yeah. you have so to that family. Uh, sorry, if that family is uh, like if you set that IPv4 equals to one in that family, then it will deny all IPv4 addresses. And if you set like particular family as zero, then it will allow those. Got it. It will not be applicable on those families. Got it. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, got it. That's good to know. So is default deny? That's going to be very useful for a lot of security companies. I mean. Uh, uh, th this is actually very much interesting to know. I wonder if Linux land has anything similar ACL wise. I'm not, I don't know. Like their, their C groups or their namespaces. That, that, okay. Maybe we, when we have Igor around here, we'll ask him. Uh, the, Shivan, do you have any knowledge about that? If Linux world has anything compatible for their containers? Uh, not sure. Okay. I haven't worked much on that. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, and we talked about this, the number patching. Uh, anyone who wants to talk about this? Because this actually sure. does seem interesting. Uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm, I'm young. So I know what nice is. Do people still use it? They do. The thing is that... Uh, well, well, one second, Jan. Jan, you are not people. You are the exception Sorry. of everything about all types of people. Jan, do you know any other human being who yes. still uses... Okay, that's good to know. Now continue. I've seen <laughs> lots of scripts on the, in the wild which use niceness. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, well, that's... Interesting. Recommendations about using it in your cron jobs and so on. The that's problem is the niceness, especially on a high core count FreeBSD system, does almost nothing. On a high what on a high what FreeBSD system? On a FreeBSD system with a lot of CPUs. <laughs> okay. Nice okay. does almost nothing using okay. the default scheduler. I see. The reason is that each logical CPU has its own run queue and the niceness is only applied within the run queue. Okay, so it's kind of per CPU. Yes, you're basically only changing the niceness on the current CPU. And if you have lots of CPUs, it can happen that basically, yeah, reducing the time and how often a thread gets scheduled in its run queue isn't that important. Got it, okay. Because Either well, you have on an unloaded system, the important part is basically how long does the thread wait until it gets scheduled. So basically, does, it, does the current thread get preempted so that you can get less than the remaining runtime of the currently running thread? So if you have preemption to the thread, okay, everything is fine. You get good responsiveness on a lightly loaded system. If you have a lot more um, thre runnable threads when you have run queues, so basically if you have a load 
a lot higher than several times higher than your core count, then uh, you have the different behavior where you actually have a run queue to pick from and not just a fairness within the CPU to schedule. So that's interesting. So, I mean, you're saying that in what? the modern world, especially like in an HPC environment, nice wouldn't matter. No, not in an HPC environment, it might because there you expect very compute bound processes, mm -hmm. which oftentimes work really uh, like the batch job from your uh, operating system design uh, exactly. book which read in a bunch of data at startup and then crunch the numbers and exactly. produce a, oftentimes a lot smaller output than the input. An extreme by example would be something like a sub solver where you throw in a, a bunch of clauses and you get a solution exactly. or a none or a timeout. Exactly. Okay, got it, got it. But got it. the thing is that there you would probably be more interested in a workload scheduler partitioning your system so that you're basically you want to give someone good performance and especially hpc workloads are often multi-threaded or multi-processes and where if you have a long one queue you get the scheduler delay until your thread gets scheduled again exactly and then you're effectively you're adding lots of latency to your interfret communication or interprocess communication, which is deadly to a lot of problems and prevents them from scaling. What you would want instead is to use CPU sets to statically partition the available CPU cores, and then delegate, give someone eight CPU cores on your big machine for however long their job is allowed to run. CPU set without VS. Thank you. And then this way, and you can modify the default set, which is what the kernel uses. So you can also even basically keep the kernel of using the user CPUs. If you want to give someone pure compute GPUs or group with CPUs, inclusive and run being such. So with a CPU set command, a command would run specifically on those CPUs, which is which could be very yes. interesting in a, uh, what do you call it? In, a, in an HPC environment specifically. If so you it's... want to limit, um, if you, let's say you have a paid tier for your CI pipeline, mm -hmm. you're hosting a CI pipeline as a service. You want to give the customer decent performance without suffering from noisy neighbors. Exactly. And what you would want to give them is basically for each job you submit, you have up to 30 minutes of eight cores or something. Okay. After the timeout, the jobs get killed as uh, time exceeded. But while it's running, it has really good performance so that you get what you want. There is another thing you want to look and into. Which one is second, the, just to be clear, CPU set supports jail. Well, that is yes. what I wanted to say. Okay. Indirectly through the, no, through the uh, hierarchical resource limits. RCTL. Uh, RCTL. And, and do we, by any chance, does jail conf also support the, J, the CPU no, set? No, you have to do it through the uh, exact or yes. something. Okay, wait, what? Oh, you mean uh, exec on the host. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, exactly. The, through the hooks which execute on the host, like the setup right. or uh, prepare, it's called, or something like this. But Jamie, we have a CPU set ID, which is we can read what the policy is set about a jails. Yes, but you yeah. have to create it outside of it. Of course, of course, got it. Okay. Yeah, can, then, a jail gets a CPU set when it's created, but to do anything with it, that's something you have to exec inside the jail to change any CPU set policies. The other thing I worry about is what happens during J attach. Does the CPU set of uh, all threads, because I think CPU sets are per thread and not per process. So does the J exec, uh, J attach system call go over all threads in the process to replace their CPU set? Or can a process, 
attached jail to... attached does not like multi-threaded processes jail attached but what does, does it do like... with them it it already i know i i can't I'm, is it um root directory it's something where it's not changing every thread so there's, there's just uh the comment in the kernel don't do this with multi-threaded basically it's uh, <laughs> it needs work <laughs> okay, so uh, just to be clear, so uh, when we have like if I do JLS CPU set, I can see the CPU set that is assigned to each jail, right? Mm, I think you have to list yes. the jail to see it. Yeah, yeah of course, it's of course. Property yeah, with of the jail. Yeah, with no, yeah. Oh, with JLS, JLS. Yeah, yeah it's with not JLS, CPU set. Dash L. So I have like jail zero assigned to CPU set ID five. Does this mm -hmm. mean that the jail is not able to use other CPUs or? Yes, that's so intentional. Each, each jail is using a single CPU. No, a CPU set is a set CPU of CPUs set. and okay. those sets are allowed to be overlapping. Okay, and then with the CPU set command, you can specify what a each CPU set means. It could be yes. a single core, it could be a multi-core, it could be yes. dual core if you want to. Okay, got it, got it's it. A got set, it. It's a subset of the available logical CPUs. Okay, so we're talking about the word set as in mathematical set, got yes. it. Yes. Okay, so if I do like J, uh, CPU set dash J and give it a jail ID, in this case, I don't know, maybe even a jail name might work, jail fin zero. I, well, that doesn't work. No, uh, um, you have to reference it with a, a jail ID or name but using the dash J. Dash, okay, CPU set dash J, and I gave it the jail ID, great. And if you go down that rabbit hole, you will quickly also discover the NUMA support. The, the new NUMA support. Yeah. Okay, got it. And the thing is, which is also possible, is you can you look up RCTL, yeah. which is jailware. Yeah. And there you have to be careful because RCTL, uh, RCTL has something called PCPU. And that's percent of one CPU. So if you assign it 100, it can use one logical CPU. Got the, it. The terrible thing about this is that the implementation adds just uh, prevents this thread from becoming runnable until it has a quota to use up again. So what happens is it feels quick when you put in a CPU bound job and suddenly everything in this um, jail or whatever subject you're targeting starts to stutter because every time it has used up its quantum mm -hmm. it gets uh, marked as unrunnable until the next tick mm. so a thousand times per second you can be stopped and started again stopped and started again and prevent it from running and while it may work for uh, and if you have a really compute heavy task, it will oftentimes use up the quantum or a lot of it before uh, the interactive parts get scheduled again. Again, we have multiple run queues, but a global uh, resource to consume. So the schedulers don't, the, the scheduler doesn't do a good job in showing the fairness between run queues regarding this limit. So instead, mm -hmm. it's better to just allocate full CPUs to CPU sets. So you would want to use the uh, PCPU for this. Okay. I, I am still having a little bit of a hard time understanding CPU set, but may maybe I'll go over Okay, a the... CPU set, normally if a, a thread can get scheduled to any logical CPU on the system, any hyper thread in hardware. Of course. On a modern server CPU. Let's say you have 32 real cores plus hyper-threading, that me means you have 64 logical CPUs, which can get which a thread can run on. Okay, now you have the set of up to 64 uh, CPUs. Exactly. And as soon as you have a CPU set, you restrict the threads or processes using this um, CPU set to get only scheduled to those CPUs. Okay. In the set. So, so first you can you have partition to, your CPUs. First, first you create, like if I have 64 okay. CPUs, I can create a partition of four, each of them being 16 CPUs. Okay. Um, 
simple, it's probably easier to explain with Beehive for virtual machine. Let's say you want to have virtual machines, see around, uh, which should not impact each other. So that two users having their own virtual machines exactly do not suffer too much from noisy neighbors, and instead it feels like they have their own smaller machine. Okay. What you would do is you uh, tell you create a CP. You modify the default CPU set, which is always there, to restrict the host kernel and everything else to use. Let's say the first eight CPUs. Okay. Then so now, so now the first for each VM... Beehive guest, mm -hmm. you make sure to wire down the memory so that you don't get demand paging of guest memory, mm -hmm. because swapping that in is also very noisy. And then you tell Beehive to pin the CPU threads to and allocate the CPU um, set of just the number of pin CPUs. Okay. And then the guest can be almost perfectly sure, except for some unreroutable interrupts or something like this. Yeah. If you have some peripheral on your hardware, which can only signal an interrupt to this CPU core, okay, then it has to be proxied somewhere. But normally you can make sure that only this Beehive get vCPU thread ever uses this physical, logical CPU. Okay. And any time the guest vCPU so it wants to run instructions, it can. This is the nice thing about this, so that you don't have a problem that, yeah, there's something very latency critical. Let's say you want to, you have some PCI device passed through and it's driving a RGB LED matrix and sound mm -hmm. card and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And you want to run your uh, audio visual, audio visual effect machine. From a virtual machine. I, I have a stupid question. Do other operating systems have this? In a way. So Linux has something where you can restrict, uh, disable, I think you can remove CPUs from the normal scheduler and then you can explicitly pin to these CPUs. I don't remember ever reading about Linux having this design with sets and so on. I think you have to do it a bit. I think it has, uh, Linux has, uh, uh, like there are two type of one, we can set affinity, yeah. CPU affinity, like uh, some CPUs are more likely to be, uh, mm -hmm. the process is more likely to be scheduled on some CPUs. And you can also uh, put restriction that only these CPUs are allowed. Yeah. I think uh, some, uh, and there are some numerous UTL command also, uh, where you can uh, what limit you the, Numa CTL, uh, oh, like yeah, yeah. Numa uh, uh, non-uniform. Yeah, yeah. There you can, I think, uh, bind uh, the process with the particular CPU nodes and memory nodes. But if I remember correctly on Linux, you always have to do this one to many relationship explicitly instead of collecting the CPUs into sets. Um, so you don't have this indirection for sets. Oh, you mean you have it like direct CPUs, not CPU sets, right? Yeah, you would basically tell the this scheduling class is not allowed to use these VCs and these CPUs, leave this alone, and then they get are left idle basically, and then you can pin threads to these CPUs. Okay. Uh, he, he, here's a silly question though, because I've it, been trying. I this. haven't checked in a few years, so it may be completely different now. I've been trying this for like ten minutes since we started talking. How can I list CPU sets? Uh, there's a flag for it. I honestly can't find. Oh, there we go. Dash L CPU list. CPU set dash L all. I get empty. Nope. Like whatever I write in there, it's empty. And oh, invalid argument. Okay. That that because I don't have. That many mm -hmm. cores. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it will tell me on which CPU set a core is on. This See, is actually a very fascinating topic. I mean, this could be very useful for a lot of the academia yeah, who do need to run. But what's missing there is a is a schedule. It's basically um, an allocator. Okay. Uh, you can explicitly create these, but what you in a let's say you have an HPC rock 
to like last week we talked about this. Mm -hmm. What it really wants is to allocate this job eight logical CPUs, let's say. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care which ones, just eight ones which aren't already allocated. Mm -hmm. And this is a bit what's missing. Uh, a service where you tell it, basically it is the point responsible for managing this and you would just tell it, I want a new CPU set with this properties and would tell you this is its CPU set ID. And if you make this a daemon, it can solve the race conditions. Of course, you could use a locking protocol with a well-known log file and every form modifying one would be then expected to use this. Or you could recheck the result if there's a contradiction afterward, but it's probably better to have a basically a CPU set D where you tell it, I want this many CPUs in my set, give me a new set. As far as I know, this does not exist. It wouldn't be hard to write. Again, the mechanism is there. The policy is uh, left up to the uh, operator. Mm. So, I mean, uh, again, this is getting way, way more interesting than I thought that it would. So let's say if I do something like this and I will show you to you in a second, uh, what was the uh, CPU set dot ID, right? In the... Mm, let me check something. Yes, CPU set dot ID. So, okay, here's, here's an actual output from my machine. So if you just run CPU set dash G, without any further arguments, This is an actual output from my machine, which is a, you know, JID and name and CPU set ID. And then you said, if I do CPU set. Well, I just said, which you can see I have a system with 12 uh, logical CPUs because it's a Zen 2 six core machine with hyper threading enabled. And there you go. This is the other one. So, yep, let's go. Okay, yeah, I can see that. And I have something similar in here as well. So. This is, this is what's bothering me is that the CPU set ID of the jail is three and five for the jail one and two, right? Yes. But in the um, output, I, it, it doesn't, I don't feel any difference. It in may the be output. that there's a set created using the default set as template, and then you could update it after the fact. You could update it after the fact. Okay. You could basically restrict where these threads get scheduled going forward. If this is what's happening. Hmm. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it would just work out of the box if this is what's happening, because it ha there is a CPU set you can modify mm -hmm. already, but you don't, the normal user doesn't have to worry about it because it's, the, it's inherited and then it just works. And normally you can do everything on all cores. But there is already a CPU set for you to apply a policy to. I see. So, so you're saying that right now there is a CPU set. With I'm the ID hoping there is three and five. Okay. Because okay. it's read only the jail CPU uh, set ID. That would make sense because either you can only set it during create time, because there would be too much ugly locking to ever update it. Right. Because yeah. you're updating the, in that case, you would have to update the scheduler data structures, which exactly. means halting all CPUs. So th that, it. that means that by design, do I? I think I, but, think I uh, can, right? I think I can set two jails in the same CPU set. That's a good question. I don't know if you can of each jail gets implicitly gets its own CPU set it as well. It implicitly gets its own. Yeah, that's what I expected. So I can't Thanks for confirming that. Each jail. So if you go through the jail exec hooks, there's mm -hmm. one which gets executed on the host after the jail uh, prison has been created. Okay. And in this hook, you could uh, modify the set, restrict it to a subset. This okay. gets called on the host before the first process is attached to the jail. Okay. 
Okay. And because of that, it would work as you expect it to work. Which is nice because uh, it means that, yeah, just like I thought I remembered, the, the, the jail subsystem already allocates a CPU set for the jail. And you only have to modify it if you want to restrict the jail to a subset of the CPUs. Okay. So that would be with something like the dash. And it, it should be the dash S command, technically. I should be no, able no. to do like. In the CPU set. In the CPU set. Or using. So um, you would update it in this hook, in the exec.created. No, no, I understand what you're saying. No, no, I, I get what about the automation part. What I don't get is like, what command would the user run in order to modify the CPU set of a jail? Uh, you read out the CPU set for the uh, using the jail parameter, the read okay. only one. That gives you the CPU set number. That, that gives me, but can I change the CPU set after the you can. You cannot change the CPU set okay. number, but you can modify which exactly. CPUs are in the set. Okay, so how do you do that? Look in the example section. I, I'm not sure that it's showing actually, because that's- It I, is. Oh, really? Let me see, query the mask CPUs. No, no, modify query. the CPU set is the thing you want. Modify is what you want to look Mod at. Oh, okay, there we go. So modify the CPU set all threads are in by default containing only the first four CPUs, leaving the rest idle. So that would be the dash L with the dash S. The dash this S is L is the, the set of CPUs. Okay, and the dash S is the uh, the set ID. Okay, yes. got it now. Okay, can I query the set? Yes. And that would be with dash G, G dash S? S, I guess. So let's try. Let's this see. is a CPU set. Dash CPU G dash space dash, dash, dash S, S. And in my case, it would be three or it would be five for these jails, right? But the interesting part is they look exactly the same. Of course they do. Because they, 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 I haven't changed anything. That's they are why. a copy of the default. Default. Okay. Okay. Now I got you, man. And then if I want to modify this, I can do, let's say, dash L and I can put, let's say, I don't know, um, yes. seven, six dash seven my last two CPUs, dash S, and now I will give it a CPU set ID and my jails and CPU set ID is, let's now say- Now inside the jails. No, outside the jail, obviously. No, no. Now, after you have applied this limit, Done. inside the jails, start open SSL speed multi, uh, the, the number of your CPU cores and all of the compute bound CPU benchmarking threads- Let's do should that. Should only get scheduled to the CPUs so you should see a few CPUs, the two last ones in your example, get very busy and the rest open, of the system- Open SSL, what was the other thing? Open SSL, um, this one. And this one is, what, did I miss a message? Open SSL. No, I'm just typing. Oh, okay. This is what uh, you're looking for. Okay. This is an example uh, way to load your system speed CPU multi. for several minutes. I see. And I know I have eight of these. So, okay, enter. And now it's doing fork child, whatever it is. But if I go to top, you're saying only two of my CPU. And you're top right. Dash, uh, uppercase exactly. P. Yeah, I can see it. I can top see it. Only, uppercase P. only two of the cores are being used and the rest are just easily idle. But if I did this by default, all of the cores would be used. Um, if you didn't modify the CPU set, it would just do what it normally does. The jailing wouldn't be relevant in this case. Exactly. And the jail would get to use every last CPU cycle available on your system. Exactly. Within the fairness enforced by the scheduler. So, so each jail has its own CPU set, which unfortunately by default is set to all the CPUs. That's not unfortunate. Why not? I mean, it's a jail. I want to restrict the hell out of it. You know, I would love to. Yes, of course. But like... <laughs> the default is you have the set. It inherits the set, and you are responsible in the created oh, uh, hook to apply a policy. I see. The jail command can't know how many 
which CPUs you want to allocate to this jail? My server is making some noise in there. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. This does is that make very interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely does. So like in the in the exec in the what the name of that blah, 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 blah. the uh, mm -hmm. exec exec uh, how exec created yeah the hook uh, we can do this is very 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 interesting like very interesting i think uh this is very interesting i mean i could imagine a i mean inside jailer for example in the templating language where you you know you can have like docker file style things you can say like you know cpu2 and it will allocate you only to two CPUs, you know, it will just choose some two CPUs and allocate you to those and make sure you're only running on two CPUs. Uh, and maybe have like some scheduling level that will say if, if this is very, I mean, this, this could be a very good viable workload uh, manager at the end of the day, you know, a very good viable workload manager. Um, mm. Sure, why not? Um, the problem is that you have to specify the sets right yeah. now. Yeah. And there isn't there a good way of defining those sets and even worse, there is no, not worse, but there is no way to automatically allocate the next two or next N logical CPUs, which haven't been allocated right now. Yeah. Uh, you could script something there, a, a t 10 to 20 line shell script could do it. Uh, what would be nice to see is something with the scanner running in the background, periodically maybe rebalancing stuff if you ever overcommit, or just in an HPC context, you would just not overcommit mm -hmm. because you can't, because you gave a guaranteed compute resource away. Exactly. And you're not allowed to uh, tell the user, yeah. Um, so the next guy over um, also wants to compute. In yeah, that yeah. case, you would have to give out smaller allocations instead of over committing your machine. Of course, of course. But no, th this is very, I mean, this is, yeah. I mean, uh, the syntax was a bit tricky at first with the, uh, uh, with the with the with the with the dash s and dash g, but now yeah, it's this like is very something much wearable. which, in my opinion, sh should get an example first in the wiki. Uh, yeah, it's a bit too specific to go in the handbook because it's goes too far. You think? Yes. Oh, in the handbook, yeah, for the handbook for sure, yeah. No, no, not for the wiki. There, it's perfect for badly even to reference from the handbook uh, for examples if you want to go further. There you go. And here's the output of the new dash G. Why dash G? Like what get or oh, get, maybe get. Yeah, like, probably okay. get. Yeah. And now get it and says, set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get and set. Yeah. No, this this is this is very interesting and it worked very well. Like uh, I'm impressed. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. And uh, is... the thing to look out for if you really want to make sure that the host isn't the noisy one, mm -hmm. is that you change the host as well, the default set. So that the host does only use a subset of the CPUs by default, so that they are really free. So like, like I could imagine this easily. Like let's say if you have a 64 core machine, you could easily do like, you know, uh, four cores in a set dedicated to the host and then the other 60 you can divide. Yeah, to your but working now groups. you get into the annoying part. Let's say you have a, your, bi-weekly ZFS scrub. You have a bi-weekly ZFS scrub and now your ZFS wants to use as much CPU as possible. Yeah, exactly. And now do you really want to restrict the the kernel to only right. this right. or I do see. you want it? There's another part uh, which is sadly underutilized in locked array by default, but unlocking it to non-super users is just one so CTL array. And that's the idle priority scheduling class. Okay. So the FreeBSD kernel doesn't just have uh, different uh, niceness levels within the normal interactive use scheduling class. Okay. But above the interactive one, you have the interrupt priority. And above even that, I think, you have a real time priority. And underneath all of this, even the nicest job is the idle priority, hmm. which gets only, and within the each idle and uh, real-time priority, there's a round-robin scheduler. 
So you have a stacked round robin scheduler for each of the the idle and the um, yeah. And normally you have for some stupid reason you have to be super user to make use of the idle priority, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, a stupid default, which I always disable. And this is what I use for my batch compile jobs or something for uh, Prudier bulk runs, mm -hmm. so that it really. I've in the past I used this on my desktop and I didn't notice it uh, when I had a good good uh, quiet CPU cooler that my desktop was compiling. Oh, which does remind me, is this also jail aware? Define jail aware. It, I mean, it's technically in the kernel. If you allow idle priority to the non super user, it's usable from within jails. Okay. Is there a man page about this? Um, uh, about idle priority, yeah, the one you have open there and the sysctl. Yeah, which is ID and RT, so real time and idle priorities. Uh, this is the one you want to set. I so don't think you ever want to enable real time priority unprivileged because that way you can Live lock for whole system. So, uh, and I don't again. I don't want to get too much into this. So, the the idle priority is there. Is there? An it's below okay. every interactive process, no matter okay. how compute bound it is. Okay. Got it. So let's say you have Pudir bulk running at idle priority, not even your M prime uh, running just hundred percent CPU all the time would get interrupted by it. Okay. Idle threads really only get CPU time if there's no non-idle thread to run. Okay. They basically replace the idle thread. Okay. That's why inside FreeBSD's top, we see something called idle. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have one pinned idle thread historically per uh, CPU, and it's responsible for invoking the idle instruction to reduce power consumption. Okay. Uh, Shivang, thank you very much. Thank you for showing up. It was very much helpful. Please, if you have time, do continue and post the stuff in this working section. We do look at the document every time, so just to be sure. And if you need any help, do join our next call as well. And we would love to. And yeah, we're active in Fabricator, so no worries. We 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 don't want to kill ourselves. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Uh, sorry, we were in the idle priority. So, okay, so there yeah. is the idle thread, which is which also has a priority. So, uh, mm, which has a special priority, which special is priority less urgent than everything else. Okay. So Any I, what I want to understand is is the use case of this in real life would be if you let's say you have a big server, a big server. Okay. You have a big box. It's nice dual. Socket Epic server, right. a terabyte of RAM, lots of SSDs, hundreds of jails running in production. And your, but the system isn't really loaded to capacity all the time. Isn't loaded to capacity, okay. Your normal everyday production workload doesn't Build. leave spare capacity. So you mm -hmm. also want to, and it's your biggest server or one of your biggest servers. So you want to make uh, use of it as build server for your own package repository using Pudir. Okay. But then there are these annoying ports like everything WebKit based, Rust and so on, the Rust compiler, LLVM, Clang, yeah? yep. the big massive ports. And if you allow all of them to run, suddenly the Pudir build jobs impact your production workload. Exactly. And you try to use nice and you find out that NICE does effectively nothing. Or you try to use Because CPU you stuff. have 256 logical CPUs because you have a monster server. And now the niceness is applied per one queue. So okay. only basically for you partition your threads into run queues. There are 256 of those and the niceness is only applied within the threads of each run queue. And so you could have two non-idle um, runnable threads and stuck in the same run queue. 
And so you would potentially lose a full tick of latency. So a millisecond per, and because this is just balanced over time, you could have spikes. And so what you see is that the tail of your latency and jitter grows because you may have one run queue once in a while, which has 10 runnable threads. Okay. And all of them get scheduled reasonably well. But the problem is what you really would have liked to do is you would wa have wanted them to be scheduled to different CPUs. And okay. this happens, but only over time it balances out and so on. But, but wait, so so I have a big Poggier machine and it's running a big batch job like LLVM or the yeah. Rust compiler. And Red it's, kit. it's Exactly. And now it's bothering my production. So yes. based on what I learned today, I would uh, ideally, of course, if the, you know, if Poudrier is also jailed, I would assign the jail to a specific CPU sets using the CPU set that I just learned about. I mean, sure. But the... then you okay. lose the ability to mm -hmm. absorb the excessive CPU cycles. You would statically partition your system. Okay. You can't just allow Poudrier to use up whatever is left over which will oftentimes be a lot more than you're willing to statically partition away to your build server. Okay. So you could have something like, sure, Podia is allowed to use hundreds of CPU cores, mm -hmm. but only if there's no other thread because the idle threads are oh. preempted. Oh. As soon as an interrupt happens, the run queue has any non-idle thread, it preempts all idle threads. So, so idle... You Threads so you, are preemptible. You're saying that with the idle idle thread and using ID PREO, I can make Poudrier use only the CP the the, the amount the of, leftover the leftover only, not yes. from anyone else. And oh it's simple. God. It's as simple to use as nice. Okay. Just ID prior ten, put it in front instead of nice ten, and okay. it will just work out. Okay, and but the RT is the opposite. The RT is the use. RT is the real time. Okay. You would use this for something like, let's say, your mouse daemon. Okay. If you still use the old-fashioned mouse daemon. Okay. You would want to make the mouse the real time. I've done this in the past on a dual core t uh, ThinkPad. Uh, I put, I did some pseudo dances so that. Uh, sudo as super user said real time priority because you don't lose the real time priority when you go down back. I would have oh, sudo RT pre sudo yeah. back. Yeah. And then I used this to run some processes. Yeah. And this allowed me to play uh, StarCraft 2 in Wine under FreeBSD while the system was compiling packages. So this is a good one. So like, uh, I like the examples here. Like this one is, if you use dash T with TCP dump, the idea behind this is that, so TCP dump doesn't drop any packets, right? No, without real time. This is dis without drop real time. it. Uh, so, so, okay. So do, uh, the opposite, make sure that TCP dump is not using- The cron the ones are also, I would consider it a terrible idea to run cron as real time. Okay. Unless you have a very special production use case because cron jobs. Are so critical. real time processes are the other way around. They preempt all the interactive threads. Okay. And even it. the interrupt threads. Not okay. the real interrupt context, but within FreeBSD. According to my understanding, most interrupts are split into two parts a lower part, which is the real CPU interrupt mm -hmm. context. And then you're only supposed to use this to gather up data and delegate it to an interrupt thread because inside the interrupt, you can't sleep and so on. Yeah. So your locking primitives are restricted and so on. And then you have this one, for example, which yeah, is ID is a good priority. idea. This is the idle priority 31. Yes. So now you're, you know, you're, you're building your machine in the background and it's not. Yeah, exactly. Background compile job, which this, doesn't this uh, dis disturb very... anyone. Except for the I.O. This is very fascinating. And you can also modify whichever. I mean, I, I, I would love to have this integrated into a RC dot a subroutine. So like um, you can have you can have demons. In a way it is. In a way it is. 
What do you mean in a way? Right. Um, there is, um, if you look, are you familiar with Acidotsopra? Uh, less or so. I mean, I use it daily. Okay. Uh, the thing is, there's a command uh, you can override. Okay. Per script. And then basically you look at what it does and then you oh. prefix this and just prepend to it. Okay. And there's also a nice supported ID. So I the niceness is supported, but I but not. Uh, yeah, I I can. There is a okay here. There is the um, dollar in braces name underscore prepend. Uh, where where are you looking at this in RC. In the RC dot page. In the RC dot page. So let's go there. Let's let's we don't need renice. Apparently it's outdated. So let's no, no, go to renice is a mechanism which was a lot more useful in the old 4.4 BSD scheduler, yeah. which you shouldn't use on anything with more than four or so CPUs. Yeah. Because it has a single run queue and no uh, awareness for locality. There we go. So name prepend, command to be prepended to the command, to command. This is for generic version of name env and name fib and name now. So name nice is very much integrated. Then we have yeah, name fib. This is fib. even more generic. You can prepend exactly. the command line which exactly. RC will execute with any command you want. And, and this uh, and this thing could be integrated in the, I mean, integrated in the sense to tell people that you can do that with either IDPRO or TPRO or CPU set with a dash capital C that would create a new CPU set with the configuration. That Something you... like this. You If you have a service foo, you could prepend it like this. And then if it did something else before, it would now run whatever it would normally do Right. Because uh, ID prior, just like nice, is what's called a chain loader. Okay. It takes its arguments and execs into the remaining arguments. So you can do something like this ID prior. Um, so let's see. So if you did something like this. Yep. You yep. will probably, unless you have more yep. than 32 logical CPUs, see the CPU load on all cores spike to 100%. Okay. But your system should still feel responsive. Got it. Got it. Because or, anytime. Or, 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 for example, if I run another OpenSSL without IDPRO, it would. It would take all the CPU cycles. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. So let's say here we would do something like. Uh, uh, that, 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 uh, let's go to a terminal mode. So uh, what's a service that everyone hates that it eats CPU? Uh, I want to say elastic search. Oh, it's also one that just really uh, latency. Um, so, critical. So, so, okay. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, elastic. And the problem with elastic search is that it doesn't support large heaps. So okay. if you have a big server, you have to run multiple instances in several and jails. And equals. I don't know if it's still around 32 gigs per instance or something. Like this. Okay. This is. And that would be a terrible idea to do Obviously. with Elasticsearch, of course, because your search would only run when there's nothing else to run. Okay. Okay. But sure that. Uh, and it only works for RC.D scripts, which are well written. Yeah, which in case of Elasticsearch is not. Okay. I don't know if it is. <laughs> the RC.d oh. script is what I'm talking about, yeah, not yeah, the yeah. service itself. Okay, so okay, so this is interesting. So I'm, I'm, you know what? Let me put something that everyone else uses so they can, you know, Nginx, for example. There. So if I do RT, sure. uh, IDPR. Again, not a CPU bound process normally. Yeah. Uh, not something you want to throw in the background, but Quan would be an example. Cron would be an example. Okay, that's a good point. Let's say you want to, or you even inside certain cron jobs, it's very useful. Let's say you want to run your periodic scripts with ID prior by updating the cron tab. So let me think about this a bit more. So let's say we want a service to run. Uh, by the way, ID PRO means lower. Yes, idle priority. Idle priority, okay. 
Okay, and, and it goes RT from, for real time. And it goes from zero, which is do whatever you want, to 31, which is the lowest. Yeah, I think um, I have to look it up how direction is this, but. No worries, we have the man pages. Uh, yeah. That's the PID information. What we want is the. Priority. Yeah. Did I lose that? There should be a number. And the um, SUSETL is documented in the main page. Oh, and there's a Mac priority. Uh, there you go. Oh, uh, nice. When did this show up? Priority is an integer between zero and RT. 31? PR, yeah, it's your 31. And zero is for highest. Okay, well, what, so what 31 does this mean? is the lowest. What does this mean? Usually 31. <laughs> that it's probably a, a macro somewhere in a kernel header. Okay. 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 And in theory, you could re change this, recompile everything, and you would have your very own FreeBSD with an incompatible ABI. You would okay. effectively fork the kernel ABI at that point. Yeah. Or okay, no, so the user, the, the ABI, not the kernel internal ABI, but yeah. Then we have Mac priority, but we'll get to that maybe next time. So, okay, so this is interesting. Uh, let's see, this is a... Um, that's Probably. new, right? Okay. So no, here... it's not really new. Um, so... Yeah. And, oh, and yes, it's new. It's I... appeared in... Why but do I, was... I have it if it appeared in 14? Why do I have a main page on a 13? Okay. Now, I want to do another one. So the other one was, let's say, if, I, if we want to do it with a CPU set, mm -hmm. right? So it would be something like, let's see, uh, what do we want something with a specific CPU set? Well, now Elasticsearch is a good idea. So it doesn't bother Yes, of course. The rest That's of, a very yeah. good idea because Elastic you want to have it on a few... Search, so, exactly. Uh, and so it's also can... a good idea for Numa. Let's say you have yeah. a dual socket server. Uh, you would create a NUMA uh, allocation policy and so on, so that uh, if you have, let's say you have a, let's say you're in the situation I am, you have an old uh, first generation Epic server, 32 cores, four computer dies. each computer has two memory channels. You could then partition your system into four NUMA domains and a CPU group for each NUMA domain and make sure that you run one Elasticsearch uh, instance per NUMA domain in its own CPU set so that you don't have cross in NUMA domain uh, memory accesses. Like this, right? This would allow to run on two, three, and four. Two, three, and four, exactly. Exactly. This is a free CPU set. Two, three, four. Yes. Oh, well, that's a bad idea. Two, three, four, five. So now it would be a two, three, four, five, right? So it would four, probably five. be more uh, yeah. understandable if you have four to seven or something, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is cute. This is cute. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds nice. Yeah. Four, two, seven. Okay, great. So here's a question though. Last bit. Last bit. I hope people watch this video because this was very interesting. Uh, I want to understand the difference between this uh, dash C capital, create a new CPU set and assign the target process process to that set. And dash C is the requested operation should reference the CPU set available via target specifier. Okay, the dash C, you have to identify it. Okay. For example, you can reference it by its set ID or through a jail ID. Apparently, okay. so it can do the translation from jail ID jail to yep, yep, uh, yep. jail CPU set, which is nice because then you don't have to do the using a sub command on your own. Right. So with a dash C, you can also modify, or if no, it no, doesn't no, wait, exist, it will create. Again. The uppercase C creates a new CPU set. Okay. The yeah, cre lower creates case, a new CPU. You scroll away again. Request that the operation should reference the CPU set, so it's already available. Okay, there but is if a it CPU doesn't, set, but, in, but you have to specify which one you want to operate on. Okay, okay. So, for example, that is why in here, create a new CPU group with CPU zero four inclusive, run bin sh on it. 
This is dash That's C small. implicitly because you create a new one and use it immediately. Exactly. exactly. As chain loading. Exactly. Or I can modify using, again, the dash C, but I have to specify with a dash P. Great. Basically, oh. what you're telling it here is find the CPU set which uh, this pr process uses and mm -hmm. modify it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Got it. That's okay. And in this case, it's not using a dash, but a comma. So CPU zero and CPU two. Two. Yeah. And a, 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 range, but yeah. I'm going to individual. check out of this. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. But it was, it was fun today. Uh, how, how, will, will we see you next week? Yes. Okay. Sounds um, perfect. Did I say, did I say yes instead of maybe? Hold on. <laughs> Let's check calendar. I'm not holding anyone accountable. It's okay. <laughs> None of us is doing this as his paid full time job. So true. No, nope, anyone... you will not see me next week. I will not see you next week. Okay, that sounds good. We'll nope. have fun and we'll see you soon. All yes. right, goodbye. Thank you, Jamie. Cheers. So, uh... so uh, just to round up my question, Jan. So, if if someone would be using the CPU, wait set... a second. I will just get something to drink because uh, I'm. Oh yeah. Give me a second. Sure. So, would we use? Let's see. Would we use the dash? That's a create new CPU. Set. Maybe we should. Okay. So maybe it's better if I just try this. So let's see, um, how do we want to even test this? So we will do like CPU set dash C dash L uh, six and seven uh, bin SH. Come back. Welcome back. So I'm doing some testing in here. So I did I did the first command in the man page. I did this right mm -hmm. now, right? This Great. will allow the new shell and all of its sub, uh, sub commands it creates exactly. to use only the Exactly. First uh, five uh, CPUs. Exactly. So if I if I run that and then I do dash G dash P and the PID of my new shell, it will say whatever the number is. Great. This is great. So now if so I want to... Inside this shell, you can say uh, dollar dollar. Yeah, yeah. And I got it. And it's working fine. So my question is, if I want to modify it for this process ID right now, I would yep. do, let's see. So I would do with the, so it's almost the same command, practically speaking. So I would do again, dash C, dash L, modify no, it now. Uh, wait, okay, yeah. you can. Yep. Yeah, apparently I can. And now I can do this. And now if I run it again, it will say yep, it changed. That's correct. And That's because correct. the CPU sets are applied every time something is scheduled. Exactly. And this... And you can't get scheduled without interruption for longer than a tick unless the run queue is otherwise empty. Mm -hmm. It will quickly rebal uh, apply it within mm -hmm. a few milliseconds. Mm -hmm. but, but can I get the CPU set number? That's the question that um, I'm trying to understand. Oh, you want I'm, to get the CPU set that number ID. for yeah. the process. Exactly. Um, exactly. That, that, that output even maybe the output includes it. It did not, but I did use the small c, the lowercase. So let me try now with the uppercase. That's the, the create a new one. Okay, that's that's the one that creates a new one, right? So here it says create new CPU set. Great, and here it also does something similar to that. So now I'm gonna do dash C capital, dash C small letter or lowercase as some people call uh, it. Dash I. Dash I. When used with dash G, print the ID rather than the, oh, that, that is interesting. That is interesting. So so let me, let, me, let me do again without the dash C capital, without it. So just like yep. I did before. And now at the bottom, if I do dash G dash P, I get, well, the, the G I. G and, uh, and P, I. C, P, dollar, dollar. I guess so. So let's see. So this that. command here will tell you okay. and the if ID I, uh, of the CPU set of the current process in the shell. Yeah, it says CPU ID 7. That's correct. It, it says PID, the PID number, CPU ID, mm -hmm. CPU set ID 7. This is great. So I got that as well. So, okay, so so what I'm trying to get to in the end is, let's say we have a user 
They want to set specific things to Elasticsearch. I don't want it to create a CPU set every time from the ground up. Or will it? I think it will, but does it matter? Not really. Um, there is no problem creating one every time. The problem is that you have to, using just the existing CPU set command, which is a thin whopper around the available system calls. Yes. The problem is that using it, you have to statically define the CPU sets and the CPU IDs and so on. Yes. What users probably want is to specify basically them something like allocate this many CPUs to this jail and nothing else. Yes. Yes. Okay. Got your and point. And this is what's uh, not implemented. Uh, there is no policy demon. Yeah. Where like a CPU or set dot com command to yeah, CP, uh, yeah 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 a CPU set to do dot this, con. maybe take this many CPUs from the upper end of the default set mm -hmm. and allocate them. Mm -hmm. And by the way, how would you modify the CPU set of the host? Basically, I would apply it to PID zero, right? Technically speaking, what? how would I modify the CPU set of the host? Uh, you can. Uh, just I, I, I assume it would be play a like... bit of a man page in the command line to find it out. But yeah, there's a default CPU set which is also I think used by normal interactively scheduled kernel threads. So you can even keep the normal kernel threads off CPUs. Oh, okay. Basically, is the CPU set number S? Uh, no, sorry, number zero, number one. Number one or zero or minus one? I don't know exactly. This is. Yeah, it, 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 here it does say that, that the by default is number one, but uh, let, let's see if it has it in the man page because I have- There's a CPU able... set zero. CPU set zero. This may be the one for the kernel. And finally, there is a root set number zero that is immutable, okay. Immutable. Oh, this okay. is the immutable, okay. Okay, the last set Wait, of the list is- immutable or? Mm-hmm. Immutable. Uh, the last set is the- Okay, every process, I would assume this implicitly means also kernel tasks. Also what? Uh, threads like your kernel threads, which are okay. interrupts. Okay, got it. Things got like it. your uh, scrubber, your disk encryption. Dash G. What does dash G dash C one even look like? Oh, okay. That's the okay. That's mine basically. And then if we, I do dash G dash I, it will say who I am. I am numbers one. Okay. So the root is zero. That's for the no no the, the zero is I think the immutable one of all CPUs, so that you can always learn which yep. CPUs exist in your system, yep. so that you can't forget that the CPU exists. Exactly. And then there is one which is the default of the of the host that I can change. So what you could do yes to implement this in a small command is you could create a new CPU set mm -hmm. with the top two CPUs uh, or something while holding so you take a lock some lock file under that one you uh, while holding this lock which the command would be, it would take uh, the, however many CPUs you wanted out of the default set. And then afterward, it would compute the intersection, no, the difference between the sets and use it. Okay, yeah, it could work. Oh, by the way, uh, there is a still no way based on what I've read to list all of the CPU set IDs. Um, good to question. list all of the CPUs. You can time. probe for them by but is there a list of all rep CPU set. Oh well, there is a stuff in the uh, in the in the in the CCTLs. That in could be system. that it's only available via CCTL. Could be. I I can't seem to find it at least. But okay, yeah, that that might be a thing. Uh, it that's may even be a binary the... one, but yeah, good luck. Uh, may, uh, at that point, you may want to look um, into the, um, sorry, you may want to look into the 
the system call managers instead mm -hmm. of the command. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. To find True. out what makes sense to look for, or just read for command source code because I can't find it right now using the, just the CTL dash a grab. Yeah, I couldn't either. I couldn't either. But here we do have some interesting things, which is the root set, assign set, argument. Okay. Uh, then we have CPU set affinity. Okay. You said set ID. Okay. So Get let's ID. see. Uh -huh. Okay. This CPU set thing is really, really, really interesting. The problem is that it's uh, very. It's like uh, wiring down you have guest memory. Yes, it's the right way of doing things, but it's also preventing you from dynamically making use of uncommitted resources because you're statically committing them, which is what you want to do if you're getting paid for some hosting service. But if you're running something in-house, you may prefer to run a bit tighter to the uh, hardware limits mm -hmm. and monitor for misbehaving mm -hmm. processes because you're in a position to basically find whoever is responsible for a misbehaving process and tell them to clean up their mess and, and that you have um, either partitioned the misbehaving service off or um, into a CPU set, for example, or something like this. But yeah, it's it can be argued either way, and there are valid points either way. But as soon as you have organizational boundaries to cross, so something which looks, uh, feels, and quacks like a duck, uh, a tenant, mm -hmm. then there's this a point where you really want to have static partitioning because the annoying part is if you over deliver. Let's say you have a jail and you promise them the equivalent of one CPU core and they get used to being able to make use of all CPU cores because you never applied with resources and then you increase the load and suddenly they start complaining about getting what they paid for because they always had access to more. Okay. So you don't want to provide a two a, too good of a service because then you are implicitly committing to always providing this level of service. Uh, something else to play with if you play with this is the what's better working inside um, RCTL than the PCPUs. You always can uh, use RCTL if it's enabled to mess with the available IOPS and disk bandwidth. So one of the things RCDL can restrict is how many read or write IOPS, IOPS uh, yes. you have access to. Which is also jail aware. I don't know how that works, but it's also jail aware. Uh, yeah, it's basically the request goes through a queue and is marked as blocked oh. until the there's quota. So there's a bucket allocator similar to a simple network band, network uh, traffic shaper. And there's a queue in the kernel of IO requests and the threads are just blocking until they, the blocking requests are processed. Okay. This is my understanding of how this is supposed to work and it works better than for uh, yeah things where the CPU is blocks on rather than really using the CPU because mm -hmm. the PCPU one is a bit strange and it's different from all other types because it applies how much of the real CPU time you're allowed to use rather than system calls or other resources. So there is no, no way to tell a process, hey, uh, or any subject you're applying resource limits to, to tell it, hey, um, something is wrong here. Please uh, make sure you stay within the limits because there is no system call. It's similar to how the performance uh, of a memory map, M map using database is great in the beginning until it suddenly falls off a cliff and you don't know what's happening. Have you ever seen this in production somewhere? Not really. So one of the things is you have things like the LMDB from OpenLDAP. It's a B3 based database 
and the whole database file is mapped. Read only for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And this is great for performance because you simply put in the, basically the version, you start your read transaction at, and then the writer only has to make sure not to overwrite anything with the version number um, equal to or larger than the lowest reader transaction. So don't, similar to how ZFS won't overwrite something unless it's uh, unreferenced. Mm -hmm. The performance is almost ideal in the beginning because it's memory map. There is no system call required to read something. It's just a memory map file. This is great. But you reach a point if you have a large data set where the data set no longer completely fits into memory. And now your reading thread doesn't perform an intentional system call, but instead does a page fold on the missing page. The kernel will page it in and continue the thread. It never did the system call. It just stopped until the page was paged in. And this is terrible to debug and, and figure out unless you really have a suspicion that, oh yeah, this annoying thing is what's going to happen. <laughs> because Billy, you have to come in with a theory of and past trauma to debug this. Uh, question. Yep. Uh, this is actually very interesting because I mean, I I think it would be also a good ABI, API, sorry, a good API to have RCTL, but launch a command, you know, like it would do RCTL dash A, the rule, and then dash C, a command. This doesn't, that's not really possible. Okay. Because RCTL, if you go a bit down, Right. Uh, about you. you have a subject type and ID. Yes. Go and up the again. subject. But wait, I mean, and, it, yeah. wait, wait, it is possible with the process. Yes, you know, but like, what about its child processes? What if it forks? Wait, oh, 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 that's actually very interesting. Wait, so the RCTL doesn't apply to the forks? Not if you go by numerical process ID. Okay. You have four types of subjects you can target. A process by its ID. Okay. Okay. If and you it fork, doesn't apply you to have the a fork. new process with a new ID. Okay. Got it. A user it. by its numerical ID. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can specify a name. The name gets looked up and replaced. Okay. Or a logging class or a jail. Okay. Exactly. So the logging class is something vastly underutilized, mm -hmm. but also tracked by the kernel. Uh, that's actually also interesting. So, so can you launch a new shell with a specific logging class? Yes, but setting the logging class is the super user operation. Is a super user? Okay, got it. Wait, so but as you can do this, but not in a way where you only change it because it's part of uh, the the specification in login conf. Hmm. You can set the locking class there and as you applies it, but there's no command in the base system that I know of where the super user can just say, I want to take this locking class. The system calls set locking class exists, but there is no easy dump command line wrapper to only set this to a string. Hmm. This dummy 10 line shell program doesn't exist. Got it, got it. Okay. Uh, sorry, 10 line C program doesn't exist. The next thing is you can target a jail by name or ID again, but it gets translated to the jail ID, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes, it does. Internally, and it does. The thing again is that yeah, you the locking class is a string. It's a, I think up to thirty two include, but this includes the null byte string, and it's just tracked in the kernel and not directly used mm -hmm. uh, normally you run everything as default or daemon or something but you could define a, in login conf mm -hmm. a new login class apply it to a user and then have this be used got it and this is interesting because it's the only the super user can escape its logging mm -hmm. class. Only the super user can escape. Okay. And because almost nothing knows about uh, logging classes, as 
in locking classes tracked by the kernel as the set by the set locking class system call. Nothing messes with them by accident. So something like engine X dropping its privileges. Uh, that the privilege into, uh... dropping code doesn't know about locking classes, so it won't escape them and drop them. Yeah, that does get me to a good point, which is uh, how can you print the logging class of a user? Um, you can, wait, uh, define what's the kind of, what are you looking at? Do you mm -hmm. want to know which logging class is defined for a user name in the password file? Uh, no, I mean, it's not setting the password of file, right? It is. Oh, it is. The logging class as defined in locking conf, but the kernel doesn't track everything, only the name. Okay, got it. Okay, so that it will be in login.conf. That would login be login.conf the... defines the locking classes. Okay, and we have if you default... change this file, you have to recompile it, yes, because it's read so often like the password file and so on, mm -hmm. group file that it's cached in a read-only uh, yep. database. You recompile it and the normal lookup functions, um, try to use the compiled database or the host, the user-specific file, mm -hmm. because you can also have a dot uh, locking underscore conf file in your home dear. Mm -hmm to change things like your default path in a shell uh, independent way. So th that's correct. So like if I use like PW user at let's do help, I can set my logging class using the dash L capital, but where is that saved? In Etsy password. ETC pa uh, master.password and password. So there are two files to look out for. You have the traditional so BSD followed a different uh, way than Linux. In Linux, they have the extra shadow file. Yeah, yeah. And if you do get and, and uh, pass the day on a Linux system, uh, it will not show the passwords. You have to query the shadow file. Yeah, yeah. Just which like is its own namespace. In BSD, as soon as you have a super user, you also get the the password hashes in the past the day map. Mm. So you can use VIPW yeah, yeah. as root and it will uh, edit the master password file. And the normal password file is just a filtered copy maintained for tools which directly read the password file without going to the right libraries to do it. I am though having a hard time understanding. One sec. What what man page would that be? Uh, man five password. In which place is the class? Oh, there we go. Users login class. So it's one, two, three, four, five. It's in five. Yep. Oh, I've After never. After the group ID. One, two, three, four. Mm, I missed it. One, two, three, four, five. No, that's the name. That's interesting. It's okay. after the group name. It's after the group name. It's the, is it a master password? So if you see it here, men five password. Found it. Okay, you have yeah. name, password, user ID, group ID, and then class. Okay. Okay. Got it. Now I got uh, But this okay. is the class as defined in mm -hmm. the login conf. In the login conf. Yes. Okay, so got it that. expects such a class to be defined. It just doesn't just apply the, yeah. Got it. Okay. So name, password, UID, group ID, and the, okay. And it would be, and if, if nothing exists in there, it would be default, which is the first one. And if something exists in there, it will match so, it. Um, so it would be a string. The name is of the, yes, it's a string. Okay, great. Got it. This is very interesting. Locking because... classes are named, not uh, not ID indexed. Okay, this is actually very interesting because uh, so okay, got it, got it. And let's see, because I've always noticed this Russian, you know the yeah. This is uh, from the days before uh, Unicode. Unicode, I know, games, right? Where you had to pick between Latin one, Latin nine, and so yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know the pain we have the Ormsky for Armenian ASCII. Okay. Exactly. Uh, the Japanese have even more interesting uh, character encodings. Mm -hmm. 
they have multiple 8-bit encodings and 16-bit encodings. Oh, that's And then the terrible thing about the 8-bit encodings, because 8-bit isn't enough for them, yeah. is they have 8-bit encodings with unlimited length shift sequences. So you basically can switch into a different plane and you have basically shift the number of a plane you're shifting into and you stay in this plane until you shift out into a different plane. And there's no limitation how long you're allowed to stay in a plane. So you can't recover, resynchronize or recover in mm -hmm, a stream. Mm -hmm. stream. It's not like UTF-8 where you can resynchronize, mm -hmm. which is really terrible if you want to split, do things like grab mm -hmm. uh, or other fast substring searches. You can't do a proper fast substring search multi-threaded because... Potentially, the first byte will switch into a plane and never leave it. It's really... Uh, it's... This is also very interesting. Okay, so we got to that part. Well, the, uh, by the way, others had some good comments in here as well. Let's see if mm -hmm. you want to go over them, but maybe we'll go over them next week. Specifically, uh, we had add the FSGL as a command in the list. Well, maybe... Who's mm -hmm. in touch with? Okay. SNMP code ideas, code reviews that should be incorporated. Uh, we had a social media question, which was our KLD list now automatically loaded. With... Uh, sorry, what? So uh, this was KLD a good question. List, um, the KLD list, uh, uh, rc.conferable, as read by the KLD uh, script, and it just loads all of these. So the question is, is like when you do if config bridge create, it automatically loads if bridge. Yes, but that's done by f config unless yeah, exactly. you uh, unless you pass it the dash n flag. What does the dash n do? It disables automatic kernel module loading. Oh, that's very interesting. I think that might be interesting uh, that's, to some uh, people. So it's written in the man page. I've, dash I've, I've never I've never noticed it's it, a actually. kilometer long, long but if you see here dash n is able automatic loading of kernel network okay this is very good if uh yeah if the, 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 the driver is a kernel model here flag. okay that's that's good that's good that's so good. normally uh, it will try to load a kernel module if it's needed mm -hmm. so if you try to, just try to create a wireguard interface without mm -hmm. loading the wireguard module first Unless you pass this n, it will uh, and or your secure level is too high to load kernel modules, it will uh, load the WireGuard kernel module and start creating WireGuard interfaces. Yeah, true. Okay, so that's another good to know. feature which is sadly underutilized in ifconfig is the format where you can have it. Uh, write the addresses in CIDR notation instead of the ugly default notation. Yeah, yeah, right, right. With a, with a dash F, I think. Mm -hmm. Dash F or dash T or something. I, I, I remember it was being, yeah, dash F with a type. Yeah, or there's yeah, also yeah. an environment where to change the default format. Mm. Yes, yes, there is. I think... EF in, config in underscore config format. format. There you go. Okay, good. Yeah. That would Same be syntax. Handy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got to that part too. Do we have any other questions that we can answer? Um, uh, wasn't but there something way... else to watch out for? Mm -hmm. And that's starting with FreeBSD, I think, what? It's the dev match. Yes. Uh, dev match um, uses the database of known drivers, basically. So, for example, PCI devices and USB devices are identified by a vendor and a product ID. Mm -hmm. And it will look into the drivers uh, for the IDs of all new discovered devices and will look up if it has a driver and will auto-load it. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a network card and the mm -hmm. driver for it isn't in the, the generic kernel, deathmatch will find will potentially auto-discover it and will make sure that during early uh, boot, the kernel module is loaded so that it's uh, always usable for you. Um, but 
the downside is that if someone plugs, knows about an exploitable uh, USB driver and, ha and knows how to use a USB ducky, they can have a lot of fun on a con at a conference. <laughs> Here's my USB stick. And if you're really clever, you can make it appear as a USB hub with a USB master device and your exploit device. So, so uh, let, let's also do this one. So uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the question was, wasn't there a way to pass hardware NIC into a jail? As far as I know, it's possible because I did that of like course, a couple of uh, days ago. So the question is not precise enough to answer completely. You can use a hardware NIC with VNet. Yes. And that just works and doesn't require any special driver support. Exactly, exactly, yes. But let's say you have a nice NIC with SIIOV support. There is a file, the iovctl.com file for each of the physical NICs. So let's say you have a, a dual ported nice NIC. Mm -hmm. For each of its physical ports, you will see a PCI Express device. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's one of those that look and feel like two NICs on a single slot. And not one device with two ports. Okay, now for each of these, you could have uh, a configuration to say the first virtual device should uh, not be a pass-through device, but should be a SIIOV device on the host. Mm -hmm. And then you could have even normally for Beehive, you would have the host if it has access as uh, IOV CTL is the command you are looking for. IOV CTL, oh, there it is. The syntax is pretty simple because you can't configure much in the, if you scroll down a bit, you see an example. Oh no, you have to look up the file, okay. Uh, there's a, sim scroll down a bit. So Boolean MAC addresses, strings. Yes. Here's yeah, an example. Down there, you have an Intel 10 gig NIC. Mm -hmm. It has up to three, uh, it's configured for three virtual functions. The default behavior is that the virtual functions, so one, uh, zero, one, and two, are pass through devices. So the pass through driver will attach to it and it's only usable to pass through to Beehive. But the host gets um, access as well because for the Virtual function zero, mm -hmm. the pass through default value is overwritten from uh, true to false, meaning the first virtual function is available as the de device to the host kernel. Uh, do you think there's a typo? This should be VF instead of no, VF? This is the physical function. Oh, physical function. Got it. Okay. This is the physical function. And then you have a default and there you have the virtual function and they're just indexed. Okay, got it. And for the first virtual function, uh, this is over. If you wanted to use jails, you could instead configure them all except for the ones you potentially either want to just create and don't use or pass through to Beehive. Mm -hmm. Disable pass through so that they show up as additional network cards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you could pass v via VNet to a jail so that you have yes. one physical network card show up as multiple network interfaces and you just pass some of them off to different jails. Mm -hmm. The advantage is that you don't need a bridge in, to do the software bridging. You don't, uh, yes. So instead, now each it just, jail has yes. full access to its own NIC, even if it's only a virtual function. The downside um, of using I, virtual I have, functions. I don't have to ask. So the, the interface IX is zero, does it disappear from if config list? Uh, I think that depends on the driver, but you can't Got use it. it. Got it. And, and what, what you does... see instead is an IVX zero, yeah, IVX I was one, say, and so yeah. on. Yeah, 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 exactly. And some other drivers may even use other naming conventions, uh, set the Chelsea or Mellanox and so on. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to send me a 
collection of nice networking cards to play with uh, be my guest, but I'm not going to spend thousands of uh, years on network cards just to find out how buggy the drivers are. <laughs> Okay, and then this gets run through IOVCTL. IOVCTL applies this exactly. configuration. There's an rc.d script for it as well. Which would be dash C dash F and it does everything. Yeah, and the or... rc.d script just uses a glob yep. to find several configurations and then applies them. Got it. Got it. This is very interesting. Okay, so it's a so, trivial rc.d script. If you look so, into your system, yeah. etc rc.d io vctl. So to to answer this question specifically, is so, if if it's a regular device like em zero, just do yeah. vnet and pass it to the vnet that you want. Exactly. The it, downside it, is that now you have given a whole physical device exactly to your jail exactly. And with uh, SIOV, you can partition your physical device exactly. into multiple virtual devices. And if you have a good NIC, it will have enough hardware resources, mostly interrupts, queues, and so on, that it makes sense to partition it because each of the um, virtual functions has enough queues and interrupts to do and other offloading features to do line rate. Which does remind me oh, how close enough to line rate. How can you know use. how can you know if a device supports SRIOV? Uh if it shows up under slash dev IOV. Slash dev IOV, right? Okay. If there's I, a I device know. node there, you have right. at least one device which supports it. Right. Um you also have to have your BIOS or UEFI. Uh, mm -hmm. configured to enable this and you need a chipset and CPU which supports it. Of course. So you're fighting the normal market segmentation madness uh, which Intel got away with for far too long. Yep. And sadly uh, Intel isn't alone anymore because AMD is now powerful enough that they are getting uh, ideas as well. Um, so oftentimes, even in server, list, you have to enable this in some menu. I am trying even to in understand. Supported in hardware, firmware, and software, you oft, it's often not enabled by default in the firmware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to talk about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for example, on Supermicro, Dell, HP, and so on, you may, you know, you may have to dig through the BIOS, BIOS and especially uh, in uh, better consumer boards, it's often disabled by default because supposedly it may add a minute amount of latency to some PCI Express operations, which may be a downside if they're right. benchmarked on gaming performance only using some artificial uh, GPU benchmark or something, which is very critical, uh, very um, sensitive to this latency. A lot more than any realistic workload. And so, the nice thing about partitioning the system like this is that um, you can have the hardware do the partitioning for you, and then you don't lose CPU cycles and throughput for the bridging of your VNet enabled jails. Yeah. Yeah, crossbow for poor people, basically, in hardware. Mm -hmm. This unified view at network virtualization, which Solaris uh, users are familiar with, doesn't exist anywhere else. So so uh, here are some good questions we got. Where can non-committers get VMs for development? There is, you know, Google Cloud free, AWS free, yeah, Oracle Arm. Yeah, you can get the free tier of cloud hosters and yeah. you're always there on sufferance. Yeah, so I, I was actually thinking, because I, I, I do have a wiki article. Let's see, a wiki, mm -hmm. freebsd.org. Um, One of the most important ones is to make sure that you apply the price limit if, because some cloud vendors uh, allow you to buy or even encourage you by making it the default to not set any uh, usage caps. Yep. And suddenly instead of 
performance dropping off a cliff uh, that will empty your bank account. <laughs> Very typical. Are you familiar with uh, here um, Krebs on security? I could imagine. Uh, so another 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 document that I did start writing and obviously completely mm -hmm. forgot is is uh, a, a, a group of articles that is called How to Contribute to FreeBSD, which it starts Ooh. with setting up a virtual machine. And in my case, it was, you know, virtual box, but I'm planning on continuing to make this. Virtual box is virtual still valid box. for users. Of course, starting on, the, on, on Windows. Although FreeBSD does support Hyper-V and Windows Professional, yep. which most people thinking about contributing to FreeBSD probably have access to in one yep. way or the other. Yep. Uh, has Hyper-V and the problem with using the classic virtual boxes that you can't use Hyper-V, so you can't use some other things like Windows exactly. Subsystem for Linux because this that relies on Hyper -V. WSL2 yep. is basically a virtual machine as well. Yep, yep. And yep. neither Intel nor AMD support multiple different kernel hypervisor implementations. So unless there's some kind of multiplexing like the hypervisor frame kit, uh, framework in macOS or Hyper-V, the, the kernel side in Windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, on FreeBSD, you can either use the virtual box kernel module or the Beehive kernel module. Yes, you can't use both. You can't and use that, both, exactly. And the, idea, and the idea is to expand this into a two parts, actually. Mm -hmm. Development machine set up on Intel, Mac, Windows, Linux using VirtualBox, because that's mm -hmm. what most people are going to use anyway on yeah. those machines. I'm assuming if someone is running FreeBSD already, they don't need the guide for that. And the other um, one, do you think they might for Beehive? You may still want to basically show them the advantages and the best practices of developing mm. inside a virtual machine. Right. Because they're best. it's tempting to start development on your workstation. But you may not, your workstation is also your daily driver. So you exactly. have to have reliable GPU drivers, network drivers. It shouldn't crash all the time. And I realized that. So you don't want to run current on there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So stuff like this, or you may not even get uh, working NVIDIA drivers or even other free drivers may currently be broken there. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to rely lots of drivers from the ports tree to get your system. So it's a good idea to have uh, the latest major release, minor release combination is you, so that you're not too far behind, uses as a virtual machine host, and then run current in Beehive. Current inside, obviously. And because another one that I really also have a, a GDB server in mm -hmm. Beehive. Mm -hmm. the, so that if it crashes, you can use this GDB server, or even think in theory in runtime. So you have a special emulated uh, x 68 ao port uh, where you can talk to the GDB server in there. And then you can debug the virtual machine in ways you really can't a physical machine these days mm -hmm. since the removal of insecure firewire. Mm -hmm. And, because and the another... old-fashioned way of doing this would be to use a FireWire connection with FireWire configured in the least secure way possible that loads direct physical uh, DNA wow. to the first uh, terabyte of uh, address space, which was once upon a time the default way of running it. Because it's also uh, efficient and fast because... Uh, uh, you really have remote DMA access via a FireWire without even an interrupt, which is great for performance. Uh, because using this uh, IP over FireWire was faster than a in, on a slow CPU than a one gig uh, network card because you can do 400 megabits uh, with a toy CPU mm -hmm. because it's really remote DMA if you allow it. Uh, and another a bit mask to change this and have each DMA request trigger an interrupt and then FireWire is just fast and not free. 
And another article that I think needs is a development machine on Apple Silicon because a lot of people own that yep. now. So you know how to do UTM and Cameo and all of that. So yeah, uh, th th these might be good articles also to finish for the uh, and for, for our wiki. Uh, and that, maybe, that would uh, answer, I, th them... I think that would answer the question of the VM for development. It is a VM for development, but it's not a cloud mm -hmm. VM. You know, it's a local VM for development. Sure, that's, that's also nice. valuable because you may need access to your local NAS or something. Exactly. The next thing you may want to have is if you have a virtual machine running somewhere, especially if you have a virtual machine host mm -hmm. running somewhere, and you maybe want to set a budget basically, because as soon as you have a budget of like 30 or 40 euros a month, you're willing to spend. You can rent a physical server, a dedicated server, and install FreeBSD there. That's within the reach of a lot of, let's say, gainfully employed. Mm -hmm. Because you yeah, have spending 30 or 50 bucks a month. It's not nothing, but it's something a lot of people are willing to spend and um, easily able to spend to rent a server. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question here, mm -hmm. let's see what we got. Oh, yeah, right. So Michael was asking about this, which is uh, uh, there is apparently a FreeBSD graphics call that is in the sure, meeting. but it's been sporadic, I think. Uh, they had a call this year, but I don't yeah. know where the minutes are or or what what or or if we can join them. So um, I I don't think I'm the right person ask, to answer. Probably this. ask Michael uh, the Holodexter. Okay. Mm, you will probably know where they meet. Okay. So or that was another question, and the last question that we got is, uh, Mecca wrote about the jail crossbow. I mean, crossbow style mm -hmm. networking. Can you? Uh... I wonder if it is if it would be possible to disable setting IP addresses at all, unless it's DHCP client. Let me have a look there. Setting it. Um... So the article looks like this. Uh, once I started learning about containers, maybe I should do it like this so you can see it as well. Um, Mika.s. Okay. Um... Mm. Do, 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 do. I will just look up his blog. The user, the the user cannot run PFCTL unless the VM only groups and hmm? the locally developed to central. Yeah, order. I don't know if PF is fully VNet variable visas, but it should be. I think you are supposed to be able to use it, uh, and it should be safe to expose the PF device. You have to unhide it, and then it should be possible. Obviously, but I think his question is different. His question is. Can we make a jail where the user cannot set the IP address, but only the HCP can? And I think this is where IPACL... Not IP really. This might be where IPACL can come in right away. Mm, no, because where would IPACL learn the address from? The policy. Where does the oh, policy right. get sourced from? Um, you would have to run a PF, uh, sorry, a DHCP client... Okay. In a trusted VNet, which could be the host, okay, on behalf of the untrusted one. So what what I do imagine here being possible is what could be done is is, is to is, use jail nesting. Actually, I had another idea, which is what if when IPACL lands, that the as far as I know, the HCP servers, at least most of them, are able to run a script post, you know. Post uh, stop DHCP servers won't run any scripts. DHCP clients. So no, no, no. DHCP servers. No, DHCP servers don't normally don't run a purse. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe um, as far as I know. Which one? Uh, ISC DHCP post script. It should be something doable, as far as I know. Um. Okay, there's a DH client. What about the, DHCP D? Oh, there you go, on commit. Yeah. On commit. Uh, which one are you looking here for? So let's actually Google that. So I see DHCP server on commit, which is when it commits. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the IP 
on expiry on release. There you go. On commit on expiry on release. So yeah, you can you can execute yeah you can execute a script after you commit an IP address. But which is this one? Well, yeah. Anyway, but what do you want to do here? This is right. would be so on the DHCP server. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I was In thinking. In this case, why even run a why even run a DHCP server only to have the jail request an address, then the jail, the, oh, why? This is such an unnecessary co complication to have the jail start uh, this allocation by doing a DHCP uh, lease re request instead of just having the outside the jail manager do the allocation on its behalf. So, so the idea that Mecca has here is, is he wants, his is his exact question. I was wondering if it would be possible to disable setting IP addresses at all, unless it's the HCP client. So my idea here was on commit, you run a script that has the IP address that you just set. And it, it, it would set up, but you don't know what jail that was. That, no, oh, no you, you don't know, you don't know. You, you no, know you don't. Address. You no, know you don't. Wait. Address. All the DHCP server knows is what's in the DHCP packet. Exactly. Which or is, frame, to be more correct. Yeah, which is in this case is the MAC address. Yes, and whatever client ID or so the, it may have sent along. It may also be a host, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, yeah. but that's none of this is trustworthy. And at least normally the DHCP server is running somewhere off far away. On some device, the, right. the host does not control. Exactly. So you cannot exactly. assume, unless you're running it on the host as part of your jail manager, that the DHCP server is under the control of the jail administrator, of even the host master of the FreeBSD jail host. Cannot presume or a good. There's oftentimes an organizational yep. boundary between the server yep. operators and the network, the network operators. So, and the network sta staff, if you, if you tell them to drop this in, either they'll tell you, sorry, we can't because our whatever Cisco box doesn't support this feature, yeah. or we will just tell the host user, ha, 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 go away and die in so the worst case. The, 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 which means that uh, technically there is no answer to this question. It's not possible to do. No, there is. Okay. In different ways. What you would have to do is you would have to run a DHCP client mm -hmm. outside of the untrustworthy VNet. Okay, so on the host machine, I'm running a DHCP client. Mm, yes and no. Yes. You could use jail nesting. Okay. No, no, I mean, just to make it the simplest way possible. You have a VNet enabled jail. Yep. You run a DHCP client there. Okay. And then you have a sub jail. Okay. Which is not VNet enabled. It's either um, aliased. Okay. Which would be the easiest way to just have the VNet enabled jail start an alias jail with the DHCP least address. Okay. And okay. then you have the normal restriction of an alias jail inside the sub jail, which is quite acceptable because you can allow it access to the loopback and so on. Because there's nothing to be protected on the VNet enabled parent jails uh, loopback. So you're suggesting to run a VNet jail that does the DHCP call, and then it starts a non-VNet jail inside of it and yes. passes the IP address. The, an alias jail. jail, not exactly. an inherent jail. Oh, yeah, an, an alias jail. Okay. So wait, what's the difference? And What? Okay. So the oldest and most common type of jail is the alias jail. Which gets a new IP address. No. It gets a risk access to a restricted subset of the host address. Oh, right. Okay. Now I got it. Now I got it. Okay. Um, now. Inherit means full access to the host network stack. Okay. So including if you enable them at all, raw sockets and yep. everything, loopback and so on, untranslated. 
no jailing compared to its parent. So you're not suggesting at the inherit. At that level. You're not suggesting inherit. You're suggesting alias. Yes. Okay. For gotcha. the sub jail. I, I was it actually to what's learned, and then have the. For example, you could do it that way that the DHCP client script updates the aliases. The DHCP client script updates the aliases. Got it. Okay, got it. So be, was, this would work because the VNet enabled jail would be trusted part of the management plane and the untrusted code would run into in, only in the sub jail. Got it. Yeah. I actually had another idea, but I'm not sure if it would work, which I am testing right now, by the way. Yeah. So my idea was, and let's see if that does, no, it doesn't work. Unfortunately, but, it doesn't work. My, my idea was, what if you run the DH client on the host or, you know, in a trusted environment, you get the IP, then you pass it to the VNet. But when you do pass it to the VNet, the information of the IP is gone anyway. The problem so, is that a VNet enabled jail is an almost fully featured FreeBSD network stack, including all the nasty things you can do to the network with raw sockets, like spoofing addresses, injecting Ethernet, raw Ethernet frames at rest, mm -hmm. with up spoofing, just you. <laughs> Incrementing your IP address and using the next available one. If are you familiar with insecure university networks where IP address allocation is done using an Excel sheet on a Samba share or something? I don't want to even talk about it because I yeah. Do. Okay, so you have seen this, and if you want a new address and are lazy, you just ping until you find one which doesn't respond, and yep. you take it and see if someone complains. And so you want to prevent this if you have a properly managed virtualized environment. But but in, in, in the scenario that you're suggesting to have uh this in the scenario that you're suggesting to have a uh, jail that can only get to the IP that is received by the DHCP so client. The question is why even use DHCP? The answer probably is because he wa uh, he wants dynamic address allocation Yeah. Uh, via DHCP because that's what is available. Mm. If you had a completely managed network and not just a network you attach your FreeBSD server to, you would have a lot more options. You could have something like a uh, uh, netbox or something. Mm -hmm. do the allocation for you and allocate an address directly from your IPAM REST API, for example. And don't you wouldn't need this dynamic DHCP lease management. Instead, you would have some API to get your address. Mm -hmm. But this requires you to have your own address. Yeah, management stuff and so on. And that's if you want to be able to have this free BSD jail or beehive hosting appliance to just plug it into an existing network and just work like multiple virtual machines are supposed to work mm -hmm. without having to talk to any anything across boundaries again. Because oftentimes, yeah, if you want a static address, you have to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. send an e email and a, a chat message to some colleague or something or even worse you may be required to go through some ticket system and so on and then you have to justify the ticket and it won't get acted upon until the next bi-weekly whatever resource uh, allocation meeting in stupid organizations <laughs> So that's a bad uh, you, I mean, but but again, I mean, I'm I'm not trying to judge why Mecca wants to do this, but no, rather if it is but possible. I totally get why he feels DHCP is a good idea to put. The question is, if you're doing it this way, why do you want to protect? Who do you want to protect 
and to what degree and why? I, I can I can easily assume that this would be for an environment where he's running everything, but the mm -hmm. people inside the jail are not trusted. You know exactly. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And for example, he's responsible for the platform and someone else runs code on the platform he's hosting. Mm -hmm. So if the interface, let's say they have lots of small development teams inside their organization and an infrastructure team and the infrastructure team's interface to the, to, to the uh, individual application operators is we give you jails. Oh. And they don't trust their jails to behave on the network and want to protect the network from a misbehaving jail mm -hmm. running a mock. For example, That's... I've seen broken Windows uh, drivers um, allocate without releasing the old one and, and allocating a new MAC address every time on Wi-Fi every few seconds. Which is really fun because uh, within minutes they have exhausted your DHCP pool. <laughs> and then what? So you would want to have some guarantees like prevent MAC address, source MAC address spoofing. So, okay, this can be done on some nicks in hardware that certain virtual functions are limited to certain source MAC addresses. Mm -hmm. And you can even disable promiscuous mode mm. so that the uh, virtual function can't sniff uh, other destination MAC addresses than its own. You have to look how this interacts with multicast groups and so on. Okay, but still, nice idea, especially for a fully static managed network. Yeah. Okay. So, but, what, three hours we're in? Yeah. That's nice. What time is it at UTC? Uh, 12 minus 20. four, 20. No, not 20. Is it 20? It, no, it's... Date dash U, let's, let me check. But yeah, it should be 20. Uh, it should a be, clock. It should be 18. Date no. dash U, no. Yeah, 20. Sorry, I'm so sorry. 20, yeah. 20, yep. yes. Okay, 21. 20. So 2001 UTC. Mm -hmm. uh, what does Michael write? Anything else? I, I don't know. Uh, no, that just that's it. That's just the time. Yeah, or yeah. 2001 UTC. Okay, this was fun. This was a very productive call today. We went from dead code that made us kill ourselves last week to... Uh, to possible bugs, to a little bit of D-trace, to CPU sets in depth, to uh, uh, idle priorities, to development yeah. machines, uh, VNets. And yeah, no, this was a very productive call today. So uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, I inflicted a, at least one hour continuous brain dump on you. <laughs> no, but this was very useful, honestly. Like this, th these are very uh parts of FreeBSD that we don't talk about much so this was perfect um anything else or are we meeting up next week as always probably we're meeting up next week sounds good sounds good okay well then i'll stop the how do yep. i do this i think let me see stop, stop recording okay and then i do like stop recording well thank you very much and uh, whoever is watching like and subscribe and join our call if you want to as well and uh, see you all next week apparently See, uh, stop recording.